a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Now let us continue the life of Mary Sutton. For Mary allowed her love for her husband, Max, to force her to stand by him through thick and thin, despite the fact that in the eyes of the people of Sanders, he is a criminal, she knew these people would talk, that they would disapprove of the way she was holding her head high and going on about caring for herself and her babies as though nothing had happened. But Mary didn't care about that gossip, ignored it, until on Friday, she learned that the same gossip was on the verge of hurting Reverend Blaine, who at the moment to sheltering her and his home in turn for Mary's services as a housekeeper. It came about when Mrs. Proof, jealous-hearted, socially-minded character of Sanders, told Mary that the congregation objected to Reverend Blaine's attitude toward her and her husband, Max, and that if she didn't move, there'd be trouble for herself and possibly for the young, kindly preacher. Now it's Monday morning again in the town of Sanders. Max Sanders, once the leading citizen of the thriving little community, now awaits trial as a party to the recent gambling activity. Mary, realizing that Max has troubles of his own, turns to Dr. John Benson for advice and help. The theme, John's office at the children's clinic. Come in, Mary. You're out early. Well, hello, John. How did you know I was here at the clinic? Called your office and didn't get an answer, so I took a chance. Oh, sit down. Thanks. Take off your coat? No, I can only stay a few minutes. I left the children alone. Reverend Blaine's working on next Sunday's sermon. John, I've got to talk to you. Okay, Mary. What's on your mind? John, uh, I need some money. Not a lot, but I need it very badly and quickly. For Max? No, for myself. Remember last week you said people were beginning to talk about how I'm sticking to Max and trying to hold my head up? Yes. I said I didn't care, but I do now. I did a very foolish thing. I'm tried it. You sound like you gambled away your whole week's earnings and left the baby starving. Oh, I did worse than that. John, you know the proofs, don't you? Certainly. What about them? Well, Mrs. Proust came to Reverend Blaine and told him that she and the rest of the congregation didn't like my living at his home. Didn't like the way he was, well, picking up for Max and for me. Think the proofs will cause trouble, huh? Mm-hmm, they might. They've always been jealous of the Sanders, and with Max and the trouble he's in, they might have the idea that now's the time to move in. They can't hurt me, but they can hurt Reverend Blaine. So I'm going to move out of his home right away. So where do you want to go? Back to the Sanders mansion. That's a little cost of fortune to keep up, Mary. No, no, John. I figured it out last night. I'll only open part of it, and with summer I won't have to feed it, so it won't be so expensive. Suppose I could take the money I need out of the interest. Now, I don't think that's wise right now. No, you're right about that. But with the fact that Springs Hotel going to part with that raid, the interest are in a bad way. Mm-hmm. How much do you want? Oh, fifty dollars will be plenty, John. And I'll pay you back just as soon as Max is free. Fifty dollars? Is that all? Oh, yes, that'll be plenty. That'll keep me and the baby for almost a month. By that time, I, I know everything will be all clear back. How silly. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, Phyllis, so Phyllis. Mm-hmm. She's coming along all right. I'll probably move her home the end of the week. Oh. I've got to tell Danny he's got to buy a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. Well, she has to stay in it long. Maybe. Can't tell yet. There you are, Mary. John, I appreciate you. Forget it. it. Our friendship isn't worth $50. We ought to give it back to the end. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, you seen Max since he talked to the DA? Oh, just for a short while. He's awfully downhearted, John. I... I wish you'd be... Well, go see him and talk to him. He loves you, John. Max has done a lot of bad things, but he's done a lot of good things, too. I know. I know. Mary, I avoided Max because... Well, I've acted like such a heel in this whole thing. When he came to me with all that talk that he wasn't good enough for you, I agreed with him. I didn't believe a word he said about cleaning up the racket just because he loved you. It just didn't make sense. <laughs> John, I've always thought there are a lot of things in life which don't make sense, or which are very lovely. I think Max is one of them. He doesn't make sense. He has the heart and soul of a poet, and 
Yet his language and his manners are as rough and tough as a prize fighter. And look at Mr. Shane, a hardened gambler. He didn't make sense when he dropped everything and flew for the medicine to save Phyllis' life. Well, you never made sense to me either. I suppose, because I always have and I always will love you, Mary. Do you think it's possible that everything we love doesn't make sense? <laughs> it's a funny thought, isn't it? <laughs> yes. I suppose that's why they coined the phrase, love is blind. Yes, it has to be. John, will you go to the jail today and, well, talk to Max? It'll do him so much good. I'm ashamed to, Mary. Really, I am. I wouldn't blame Max for, well, trying anyhow to kick me out. Oh, you know he won't. John, remember a long time ago how we always talked about the three of us? Mm-hmm. You, Max, and me. That wasn't just a slogan. It meant a lot. It still does to Max and me. Well, it does to me, too, Mary. Then talk to him today. He needs all the encouragement we can give him. It'll mean so much coming to me. Okay, Mary. I'll do it. Thanks, John. Well, uh, when will you move back to your old home? Oh, right away, I guess. I don't want to give Mrs. Cruz any more ammunition. I'll probably have trouble with Reverend Blaine, but he'll just have to understand. Well, if you need any help in moving, let me know. Nothing heavier than a piano for me. <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> oh, well, say, Mary, uh, think it might be better if I gave you the cash instead of that check? Well, anyway, you say, John. Oh, I guess it'll be all right. I was just thinking that someone at the bank might see the check. And... Well, you know how people talk in this town. Well, if you'd rather, John. No, the heck with them. They'll talk anyway. Forget it. I'll drop around tonight and see if I can give any help. All right. Goodbye, John. And don't forget to see Matt. I'll go there right now, Mary. Any message for him? Oh, just say I love him, and I'll see him later this afternoon. <laughs> That's not news. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, John. Well... Did you say hello to your visitors? Huh? Oh, hello, Doc. Oh, I thought it was a sheriff. I uh, just had a nice little chat with Mary. Oh, did you? Well, how is she? Fine. And to love. Well, yeah, that's nice, I, uh, just gave her $50. Oh, that's nice, too. Uh, uh, huh? What for? She wants to move away from the Reverend and open up a big home. Part of it, anyway. Thought I'd tell you about some money before someone else does and you lose your head again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got a habit of doing that, ain't I? <laughs> but I won't do it anymore. I guess I lost my head for the last time. I had a talk with the D.A. yesterday, and it looks like I'll have a long time to cool off when he gets through with me. I, uh, came down here for special reasons. Well, what do you want to do? Vaccinate me? I'd like to vaccinate that dome of yours and put some sense into it. <laughs> well, what'd you come down here for, Doc? Well, to, uh, to give you this. What's that? My hand, your boob. What's it look like? Well, um, what am I supposed to do with it? Kiss it? Take it. God, Jesus, where I get it? Shake, Doc. Shake. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Well, after the way I have about the whole thing. I guess it just made me mad because I... Well, you know, I've always... Uh, like uh, me? Let me check my own words, will you? you said enough, Doc. I me. haven't said anything yet. Shut up and let me finish. Okay. I had this speech all thought out. Now you got me all mixed up. All right, I'll keep quiet, Doc. Go ahead. Well, uh, I love Mary more than I do you. Sure. Sure, I know that. I don't blame you. So do I. But uh, as I said, I like you too. Married you, so I've got to like you. You're the choice. Now the whole town's turning against you and Mary for this gambling deal, and everything looks black. Ah, yeah, but that's all right, Doc. As long as you and Mary are with me, I don't care. I know you'll take care of my little puss, okay, and that's all I'm worrying about. You know the old gag we used to have, the three of us. Yeah. Uh, coming over from the clinic a while ago, I did a lot of thinking. I'm a doctor, not a lawyer, you understand. Well, say, that's news. <laughs> but uh, I think there's one little technicality in your case, Matt, the district attorney hasn't thought of. Well, yeah? Well, well, remember, young mug, I'm not promising anything. But in as much as we're pals again, I, I might have hit on a way to get you out of this mess. Just what technicality of the law could a doctor think of that the famous district attorney might have overlooked? In January 3rd marks the end of the holidays, and teachers and pupils all over the country return to their various halls of learning. Our Miss Brooks is here today. I guess vacations are necessary sometimes, Connie. 
But now I suppose you're looking forward to returning to dear old Madison High with considerable enthusiasm. Yes, indeed, Mrs. Davis. But all the enthusiasm of a sailor returning to his dear old submarine after a two-week vacation on Bally Bally. <laughs> You'll get back into the swing in no time, Connie. Is Walter Denton picking you up this morning? Yes, he is, and I hope he's on time. Our beloved principal is designated today as Board of Education Day. Oh, what sort of ceremony is Mr. Conklin planning? Well, Mr. Stone, the head of the board, will be there for his annual oiling. <laughs> and Mr. Conklin will have the whole school lined up on the campus. Some of the students will even march past Mr. Stone carrying the flag. Well, it can't do any harm, Connie. The board might decide to get you teachers a raise in the coming year. I hope so. Then maybe next year we'll be strong enough to carry the flag. <laughs> I'll get it. Be right there. I'll take the dishes into the kitchen. All right, Mrs. Davis, and thanks for breakfast. Good morning, Walter. It's more than that, Miss Brooks. This is the morning when the glorious states of learning fling open anew. When the tantalizing aroma of chalk and pencil shavings beckons us all, teachers and pupils alike, to join hands amidst the clanging of bells come gaily skipping back to the black hole of Calcutta. <laughs> Why, Walter, I didn't know you had it in you, and I wish you'd put it back. <laughs> you did have a nice vacation, didn't you? Oh, sure I did, Miss Brooks. Uh, that is, up to last night. And then it was practically ruined by Mr. Conklin. He ordered me to write an editorial for the Madison Monitor on what the Board of Education means to me. Did you write it? Well, sure I did. And you know what a tyrant old Marblehead can be when it... I mean, Mr. Conklin can be when you cross him. But as a believer in freedom of the press, I really gave that Board of Education both barrels. Walter, this is a new year. Don't you think one barrel would have been enough? Well, giving us Monday off after New Year's Day and then making us go to school Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday is downright sadistic. Well, it's better than not having Monday off, isn't it? Well, sure. But it's not as good as having the rest of the week off, too. <laughs> well, I'm with you there, Walter. It would also be nice if they gave us February and March off. But that isn't the way the board works. And sometimes I doubt if they work at all. But, but it's all in this editorial, Miss Brooks. Here, I told Mr. Conklin you'd proofread it and bring it into his office this morning. Me? Well, sure. Hey, you're a faculty advisor to the school paper, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> Don't be nervous about handing it to him, Miss Brooks. Just toss it on his desk. I can only do that if you'll agree to do something for me. Oh, what's that, Miss Brooks? Notify my next of kin. <laughs> Look, Walter, Mr. Conklin wants to start the year off with a spirit of cooperation. You'd better destroy this literary Frankenstein. Oh, I couldn't do that, Miss Brooks. But I'll think it over on the way to school and maybe amend some of my statements. Fine. Now, I'll just slip on my coat and we can get going. Oh, swell. My pal Stretch is waiting out in the car and he's pretty brought down. Stretch Snodgrass? What's the matter with him? Oh, you know what a great athlete Stretch is. He can pick up any sport in a second. But he can't seem to absorb much with his brain. He's afraid that during the holidays he forgot everything he learned all term. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. The alphabet. <laughs> Go ahead, Stretch. Tell Miss Brooks what's bothering you. She might be able to help you out. I'll certainly try, Stretch. What's your immediate problem? Everything. <laughs> Good. As long as you've got it localized, I can help you. <laughs> well, I mean everything at school, Miss Brooks. You see, I just got to stay eligible for basketball. And Mr. Boynton says I got to take a biology test pretty soon. And I forgot so much during our vacation, I'm afraid I'm just not no good at no biology no more. Stretch, it is incorrect to use a double negative in the sentence. You just used four of them. Oh, then what I said was okay, huh? <laughs> See, I'm sure glad I didn't forget none of my English like I forgot about my animals in biology. Gosh, I used to know my animals like I know my A.B. My A, B, C. I was right about the alphabet. Yeah, I guess you were. Oh, go on, Stretch. Tell Miss Brooks some more about the test. Well, I think it's going to be mostly about birds and monkeys and stuff like that there. What where? <laughs> I've got a 
know the names of the different kind of baboons, which I used to know real good, but I forgot. Well, don't worry about it, Stretch. If you want me to, I'll meet you after school and review your lessons with you. Oh, that'd be keen, Miss Brooks. Gosh, I'll bet even the baboons know the names of all the other baboons. Well, don't worry about that either. If you just concentrate and spend the next couple of years studying, you'll be as smart as any other baboon. <laughs> I've summoned you to my office, Miss Brooks, to inform you of the fact that at 1 o'clock, Mr. Stone is due to arrive. So promptly at 12.55, the students and faculty will line up outside between the old cannon and the flagpole. Yes, sir. Then I will greet Mr. Stone and read aloud the editorial, which is to appear in the next issue of the Madison Monitor. Oh, the editorial. I am not finished, Miss Brooks. (laughs) The editorial is called, What the Board of Education Means to Me and was written by Walter Denton. Now, as you know, I am not overly fond of young Denton, but as my daughter Harriet pointed out to me, he does get off some good editorial. He gets off some tips. <laughs> but, Mr. Conklin, I you don't... You said you'd deliver this one to me after proofreading it, Miss Brooks. May I have it, please? Have it, please? Uh, but, Mr. Conklin, I haven't got it, and neither has Walter. He told me he lost it on the way to school today. Lost it? That's out of the question. He's just trying to delay Mr. Conklin, if you're going to use an editorial as a welcoming speech, you should write it yourself. Me? Of course. You're a master of the editorial form. Why, even your interclass communications are sheer poetry. They are? <laughs> they are. You sit right down at your desk, Mr. Conklin, and start creating. Well, I do have a way with words, I suppose, yes. Yes. <laughs> I'll grab the speech this morning and send it to you at lunchtime, Miss Brooks, for proofreading. Not that you'll find any grammatical errors. Oh, of course not. But correct every one you find. <laughs> oh, uh, one more thing before you go. I'd like some exciting conclusion to the ceremonies I've planned on the campus. Something that would really wind it up in a spectacular manner. Any suggestions, Miss Brooks? Well, you say we're lining up between the cannon and the flagpole? That is correct. Then I think I've got just the idea for you, Mr. Conklin. Oh, what is it, Miss Brooks? Let's shoot Walter Denton out of the cannon. morning classes, I waited for Mr. Conklin's epic essay, What the Board of Education Means to Me. But when the epic didn't arrive at noon, I decided to expose myself to a luncheon invitation from Mr. Boynton and hurried toward the biology laboratory. Just a few doors from my goal, I was intercepted by Madison's athletic giant and mental midget, Stretch Snodgrass. Oh, excuse me, Miss Brooks, but could I see you for a minute? I suppose so, Stretch. What's on your... What's new? <laughs> Mr. Conklin appointed me messenger of the day. That means I'm supposed to deliver messages. Thanks. What did you want to see me about? Mr. Conklin told me to deliver his Board of Education speech to you during the lunch period. That's why I stopped you just now. Why? I ain't got it. I haven't got it. Well, I know you ain't got it. (laughs) I'm supposed to give it to you. Well, why ain't you got it? (laughs) You ain't give it to me yet. One of us is getting nowhere in my English class. (laughs) Now, if you'll excuse me, Stretch. Oh, sure, Miss Brooks. Just leave the speech in Mr. Boynton's lab as soon as Mr. Conklin gives it to you. I've been anticipating this luncheon date for some time. Okay, Miss Brooks. I'm sorry I held you up. That's all right. I didn't mean to take up so much of your time. It's all right, Stretch. I didn't know you were anticipating. So long, (laughs) Stretch. Come in. Well, Miss Brooks, I'll be with you in just a minute. I've been trying to correct this biology test paper. It's an essay. Oh? I can hardly make out the name. The writing is so illegible. Let's see here. Could it be Snodgrass? What's the title of the essay? A Man's Best Friends is His Animals. It's Snodgrass, all right. <laughs> listen to this. Lovebirds is very nice pets as they don't never bother nobody hardly, but is all the time busy making love. Isn't that terrible? You can't knock it to me. <laughs> well, you the grammar. Yes, it is pretty bad. Here's another paragraph. 
baboons is pretty big, and the mandrill is the biggest baboon of all. They make very nice pets, as they don't never bother nobody hardly, but is all the time busy making love. He ought to change the title to an animal's best friend is his animal. You can finish that later, Mr. Boyne. Let's go to lunch, huh? Very well, Miss Brooks. Yeah, I hope we run into Walter Denton in the cafeteria. These papers must have fallen out of his briefcase this morning. I'd like to return them. Seems to be an editorial for the school paper. Oh, let's see that. Hmm, what the Board of Education means to me by Walter Denton. I'm glad I discovered this in time. The faculty advisor to the paper, Mr. Conklin, would hold me responsible for the most embarrassing incident that ever happened in Madison. What do you mean, Miss Brooks? What's in the editorial? Just a pint or two of Walter's spleen. It's a blast of the board, which I'm going to tear up right now. Yeah, uh, Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks, just a minute. Look what you've done. You, you've torn up Stretch's essay along with the other one. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Boynton. What were you planning to do with it? Send it to the Congressional Library? <laughs> Such deathless prose. Baboons don't never bother nobody hardly, but is all the time busy making love. <laughs> what am I laughing at? It should happen to both of us. <laughs> Mr. Boynton. Oh, I guess they went to lunch. Well, I'll just leave Mr. Conklin's speech on his desk. And Hiya, Stretch. I heard about the ceremonies we're going to have. Yeah, Walter. Mr. Stone's coming down, and we all got to line up and greet him. And boy, is he going to get a greeting. I'm cooking some powder down in the chem lab that I'm going to put in back of the old cannon. And when Mr. Stone gets here, we'll give him a salute that he'll hear till he's 90. <laughs> Gosh. Do you think Mr. Conklin will like that? He doesn't know about it yet. But what's this on the desk here? Oh, what the Board of Education means to me. Say, I thought I lost this editorial while I was in here this morning. What editorial? Oh, this one. Gee, I'm glad I found it. Miss Brooks is right. This could get me in a lot of trouble. But, Walter, this... This thing is dynamite. I'm going to tear it up right now. But, but you shouldn't. There's mm-hmm. something i got to tell you. In a minute. Now, what is it, Stretch? That wasn't your editorial. You just tore up. It wasn't? No. It was a speech that Mr. Conklin's been sweating out all morning. Huh? Yeah. He told me to give it to Miss Brooks. But don't worry, Walter. I'm very good at jigsaw puzzles. I'll just pick the pieces out of the wastebasket and paste them together again. Oh, God. Yeah, I better help you. Oh, but the chem lab. I got powder cooking. You better get back there, Walter. This will be easy for me to do on it. You go on back and make some real good explosives. It'll liven the place up a bit. I guess I'd better stretch. But whatever you do, get that feet pasted together fast. Okay, pal. Let's see. There's more papers in this basket than I thought. Well, here's one piece that fits to another. Well, no, it don't either. Well, it almost fits. Oh, it'll be good enough. <laughs> Denton. Oh, yes, Miss Brooks. Have you seen Stretch anywhere? I've looked all over the ground for him. Walter, what are you doing with that cannon? Cannon? Oh, I'm just polishing it, Miss Brooks. I want everything to look thick and thin when Mr. Stone gets here. <laughs> well, he better not get here until Stretch shows up with Mr. Conklin's feet. I don't know what he'll do oh, without it. Oh, there you are, Miss Brooks. Have you finished checking my feet? Uh, not really, Mr. Conklin. What do you mean, not really? I haven't begun. Uh, that is, I haven't begun to enjoy anything as much as I did that speech of yours. Uh, Stretch is carrying it for me. Uh, excuse me, Miss Brooks, but here's a speech it's right in this folder. Nice timing, Stretch. See, Mr. Conklin, here's your speech. Oh, not a minute too soon. I think this is Mr. Stone's car driving up now. Oh, uh, 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 attention, everyone. Straighten out those lines. That's right. Now, Miss Brooks, you stand on my left. I'll stand here by the cannon. Uh, Get a little closer to the cannon, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Stunning together. Quiet, Denton. Now remember, when Mr. Stone steps out of the car, I'll count three and we'll all salute him. I certainly will. Ready now? One, two... the world did you put in that cannon? It was just sort of a giant firecracker, Miss Brooks. Wasn't it, Jean? (laughs) 
Would uh, somebody please help me up? Oh, of course, Mr. Conklin. There you are, sir. Everything all right? There's no reason to be embarrassed. That wasn't Mr. Stone's car. How? I said that wasn't Mr. Stone's car. Don't stand there flapping your lips. Say something. can't hear a word you're saying. He was standing so close to the cannon, it must have plugged up his ears. Oh, no. This is terrible, Walter. What's that? What's that? What did you say? We just... <laughs> we got to come into his office. He seems stunned. Oh, come on, gang. Three cheers for Mr. Conklin. Yay, Mr. Conklin! Yay, Mr. Conklin! Yay, Mr. Conklin! What's going on here? <laughs> Why is everyone so quiet? Mr. Conklin. <laughs> oh, golly, Miss Brooks. You don't think Daddy's hearing will be permanently impaired, do you? Of course not, Harriet. This is just a temporary condition. Shall I say come in, Mr. Conklin? Yeah, what's that? What? Oh, I come in. Hi, Miss Brooks. How's Mr. Conklin's hearing? Very bad, Walter. Good. We're going to shoot off the cannon again. But, Walter! Uh, uh, that was Denton, wasn't it? Did he have anything to do with that explosion by the cannon? Oh, I'm sure he didn't, Daddy. I say, I'm sure he didn't, Daddy. That's right, Mr. Conklin. It just exploded. <laughs> I say, it just exploded. It certainly is corroded. <laughs> I don't understand what happened. That cannon hasn't been touched since the Spanish-American War. It's absolutely useless. What do you mean, useless? We won, didn't we? <laughs> you're right, you're right. It is unusual for Mr. Stone to be so late. He's quite a busy man, though. Gosh, Miss Brooks, do you think Daddy's hearing is getting any better at all? Come in. <laughs> and tell Walter to stop that racket at once. Okay, Miss Brooks. But you'll see with Daddy, won't you? Certainly. And don't worry about him, Harriet. He's not in any pain. All right, Miss Brooks. See you later, Daddy. Uh, uh, Miss Brooks, when Mr. Stone does get here, I don't want him to think there's anything wrong with my hearing or anything else. If he suspected that a cannon had exploded on school property, he'd go back to the board in a tizzy. I understand, Mr. Conklin, and in view of your condition, I think it might be a good idea if I were to read your speech to him. In view of my condition, it might be a good idea if you were to read my speech to him. Quite an echo in here. <laughs> now, remember to read the speech slowly, Miss Brooks, and when I see your lips stop moving, I'll make some appropriate comment from time to time. Come in. Well, it's Mr. Stone. How do you do, Miss Brooks? Sorry I'm late, Osgood. It was unavoidable. Well, thank you, Mr. Stone, and a happy new year to you, too. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Uh, Mr. Conklin's a little confused, Mr. Stone. It isn't every day that so distinguished a visitor honors our institution with a visit. Oh, that's very gracious, Miss Brooks. Uh, this speech, Miss Brooks, the speech? Yes, sir. However, Mr. Conklin has prepared a little speech, which I will read to you now. You? But why don't you read it yourself, Osgood? You see, Mr. Stone, he's so choked with emotion, he's speechless. <laughs> <laughs> However, I have it right here. Hmm, nice taste job. It's entitled, What the Board of Education Means to Me by Osgood Conklin. It reads, Few people realize the magnificent efficiency with which our Board of Education functions. This august body is composed of a group of able members, and these baboons grow to a height of four feet. Every word of this comes from the bottom of my heart. Uh, 
Uh, read on, Miss Brooks. I don't know whether I should, Miss I Brooks. insist that you do. Oh, well. The members of the Board of Education make very nice pets, as they don't never bother nobody, but is all the time busy making love. <laughs> What is the meaning of this? Right from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> now, see here, Conklin. If this is some sort of a joke, I don't like it. Not one bit. Oh, you're too kind, Mr. Stowe. <laughs> Hand me that last page, Miss Brooks. But, Mr. Conklin, I wouldn't suggest... Give it here, give it here. To sum up, I would like to read what I have written in this last paragraph. To which, having observed Mr. Stone's educational methods, I am convinced that his outstanding talent is his ability to eat bananas while hanging by his tail. <laughs> Believe me, Mr. Stone, these sentiments are dictated by a sense. Eat bananas while hanging by his tail! <laughs> man has obviously taken leave of his senses. But, sir, if you let me... And when they return, this matter will be thoroughly investigated. Good day, Miss Brooks. Miss Brooks, this speech, this isn't the speech I wrote. I know it now, Mr. Conklin, but I didn't. I hold you responsible for this entire fiasco. And believe me, Miss Brooks, you have no idea how severe your punishment is going to be. Oh, yes, I have, Mr. Conklin. Miss Brooks, where are you going? Out to get some bananas. There's nothing like hanging by your tail from a flagpole to whip up an appetite. <laughs> now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, even after he had read a written confession from Walter and Stretch, Mr. Conklin still blamed me for the day's misadventures. Accordingly, he ordered me to write a brand new speech for him that same afternoon. I wouldn't have minded that so much, but it meant breaking one of my rare dates with Mr. Boynton. I was complaining about it as we walked down the hall after school. Oh, it does sound unfair, Miss Bruce, but after all, Mr. Conklin's the boss. What can you do about it? Well, I could go into his office and tell him off, I suppose. But that wouldn't do any good either. He can't hear a word. Wait a minute. Maybe these are the ideal conditions. A chance to say all the things I've ever wanted to say to Mr. Conklin right to his face. Well, do, do you think that's wise, Miss Brooks? I don't know how wise it is, but it'll certainly do my little heart good. Excuse me, Miss Brooks. I've got to take this aspirin in the daddy. Well, let me take it, Harriet. There's something I'd like to say to him. He's still pretty upset, Miss Brooks. Maybe I'd better see him alone first. All right, Harriet. Here's your aspirin, daddy, and a glass of water. See? Water? Drink? Stop gibbering, girl. I can hear you distinctly. You can? Yes, yes. It happened just a moment ago. My head cleared and my hearing is perfectly normal. How wonderful. Oh, Daddy, Miss Brooks is waiting to see you. May I send her in? Very well. Daddy, we'll see you now, Miss Brooks. Oh, goody. See you tomorrow. All right, Harriet. Well, Miss Brooks? I just wanted to talk to you about my having to stay in this afternoon, you inconsiderate, maladjusted, subhuman tyrant. <laughs> what? I've got some things to tell you that I've been saving up for years, and it's going to be a great pleasure to coo them into your dainty, plugged-up ears. <laughs> eh? <laughs> How does that go again? Of all the puffed-up, overstuffed, pompous windbags I've ever met, you take the marble cake, Marblehead. <laughs> eh? Rather than try to talk some sense into that adult-pated, mule-brained little head of yours, I'll do the work this afternoon. Does that make you happy, you beady-eyed, beetle-browed old buzzer? <laughs> Yes, Miss Brooks. That makes me very happy. Good. And I just want to say... Boing! <laughs> you can hear. Yes. <laughs> From the moment you entered this office, you'll be pleased to know that this overstuffed windbag has absorbed your every word. You realize, of course, Miss Brooks, that any chastisement you have suffered in the past is mere child's play compared with what's in store for you now? How? Hey? I will not 
only see to it that our local board of education receives must the be money. contagious. It's Can't seem to hear a single word you're saying. So for three hours ago that the cannon well, went off, fish. here I'm I am suddenly that. taking stone. <laughs> well, I guess there's no sense in worrying about it. I'll just relax. This book show brought to you by Lustre Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. My purse is missing. My car is missing. My house is missing. But you won't know what you're missing if you don't see Norge. <laughs> well, another writer just bit the dust. Transcribed from Hollywood, Norge, a division of Borg Warner. Originators and world's largest manufacturers of self-defrosting refrigerators, manufacturers of America's most modern automatic and ringer washers, gas and electric ranges, water heaters and home freezers, Norge presents The Red Skelton Show. Skelton, Dave Rose, and his orchestra, Lorene Tuttle, Pat McGeehan, and Gene Tudor will be me, Rod O'Connor. Now the star of our program, Red Skelton. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. Rod, you look nice tonight. I do, Red? Yeah, your eyes are open. <laughs> Red, my eyes are open every week. Yeah, but this is the first week they can see anything. <laughs> Say, Red, where'd you go this afternoon? Well, I went down to the blood bank, and I gave two pints of my blood. You did? Yes. What did they do with it? Well, they put it in a bottle and labeled it. This is Red Skelton's blood. Artificial coloring to be added. <laughs> you know who I saw down there? Oh. Peter Lorre. Really? And I said, gee, that's awful nice of you to take time out. He says, oh, I come down every day. I give four and five quarts of blood a day. <laughs> I says, doesn't it bother you? He says, oh, it's not my blood. <laughs> You know, Red, you really ought to take care of your health. Oh, I do. What about yesterday? We went for a long hike out in the woods. Yeah, you know, things are pretty in Griffith Park at this time of the year, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they're going to get prettier, too, as soon as they start wearing shorts. <laughs> See, they wear slacks now. The girl's out in the woods. <laughs> You know, with jokes like that, we we lose more writers this way. <laughs> you enjoyed the hike, though, didn't you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I saw Little Red Riding Hood out in the woods. Oh, really? Was she on her way to visit her grandmother with her lunch? <laughs> no, she was looking for a sailor with a bottle of gin. <laughs> uh-huh. My grandmother and I were out in the woods the other day picking toadstools. But toadstools are poisonous. They are? Well, sure. Maybe that's what that little toad was trying to tell me. <laughs> Say, Red, uh, after we split up, did you see any animals? Yeah, <laughs> I saw a gopher talking to his wife, and he says, Hey, Mabel, there's that guy who's been giving us all that free publicity on the radio. <laughs> you know, it's fun to camp out, but I was glad when we finally found a place to stay. Yeah. See, you know, that was a cute log cabin we found, wasn't it, Red? Yeah, but it, it would have been a lot nicer if we had got that maple surf out of it. <laughs> they don't get it. Huh? They don't get it, I guess. They don't get it. I got news for you. Neither do I. <laughs> See, a log cabin is a thing, a little thing that comes and has syrup in it or something like that. But the woods are really beautiful, aren't they? Yes. Mm-hmm. They really are, especially those maple trees. You know, they get maple syrup from those trees. They do? Sure. <laughs> Here it comes, folks. <laughs> Say that again. 
<laughs> I see it especially those maple trees. You know they get maple syrup from those trees. Yeah, how do they get the trees to set on those little bottles? <laughs> How did they get those uh, trees to sit on those little log cabins? <laughs> From South Pacific, Gene Cuter sings The Cockeyed Optimist. Remember the car you had in the 30s? It was the latest thing then, but it would seem mighty old-fashioned now. Well, how old is your refrigerator? Isn't it about time you traded that in on an up-to-date model? On a new Nord's Jet Self-Defroster, for instance. And believe me, you couldn't make a smarter choice. Nord's, who originated self-defrosting, has really perfected it in this new Jet Self-Defroster. You'll never spend another minute defrosting because this new Nord's defrosts itself every night. So fast, even ice cream can't melt. And there's more storage space in this new Norge. Space to spare, from top to floor. A huge cross-top freezer, a regular pantry of movable shelves, even shelves in the door. There's a meat keeper deep enough for a big roast, a full wood crisper that holds a week's supply of fruits and vegetables. Why not talk to your friendly Norge dealer about trading in your old refrigerator on a new Norge jet self-defroster? You won't know what you're missing... If you don't see Nord. And now, some pages from the Skelton Scrapbook of Satire entitled Inventions. Chapter 1 Clem Cadiddlehopper's Invention. Here I am. The shrimp boats are going. I figure they've been coming long enough. Yes, there, here I am, one of nature's witticisms. <laughs> I sure been busy, boy. Well, I better get back to work on my hopper parachute. I'm making my test today. <laughs> so, what do you do? Well, morning, Clay. Well, please. <laughs> Put wheels 
clothes on me and use me for a sprinkler. <laughs> Say, uh, lover girl, honeysuckle baby doll, what are you doing out at this time of the night? Night? It's 8 o'clock in the morning. Sam, you better pull up that shade and get a little sunlight. The shade is up. It's just that dirty window you're looking at. <laughs> Why don't you wash it? Well, I do every day, but it's still filthy. I just can't get it clean. But you just wash the inside. It's the outside that's dirty. Details. Details. <laughs> I know I have the same trouble with the other windows in the house, too. You know, I'm going to invent a window with no outside to it. Just an inside will save a lot of cleaning, you know. Sam, that's impossible. That's what they said about me, too. But here I am. Sam, what's this big mystery you're working on? Oh, just another one of my new inventions. Oh, what did you ever invent? What did I ever invent? What did I ever... What did I ever invent? Yeah, what did I ever invent? <laughs> well, I, rented, uh, I invented a uh, alarm clock with only one half to it. That's for people with twin beds. <laughs> then I invented a, a foot ladder that's two feet high. <laughs> if you fall off of it, you won't get hurt. You yeah. And then I invented a rubber bell for... Phone, so it won't uh, disturb you, you know. And I am now working on a thing that will uh, solve the unemployment situation. Oh! It's a big machine that will do the work of a thousand men. How come? Well, now, there, there's a good place. <laughs> Oh, very good question. Uh, we just had a good answer. <laughs> I've invented a machine that does the work of a thousand men, but here's the catch. It takes a hundred thousand men to run it. <laughs> Sounds logical. It does? Of course. Well, that's too bad. I'll have to throw it out right away then. <laughs> now, here's, a, here's one that I'm working on. It's a protector for a buzzsaw. Look. Now, you see that look? Rubber paddle on the side of the saw? Mm -hmm. Well, if your hand gets too close to the blade, a paddle comes out and slaps you a couple of times. Oh, it seems ridiculous to me. Ridiculous? Look what happens if it wasn't there. Well, I won't be doing much hitchhiking this summer. <laughs> You're a moron. Number one, if you please. <laughs> and I'll have you to know I have letters of recommendations to prove it. I have friends in Washington, you know. <laughs> you poor thing. Here, let me bandage you up. Oh, no, you don't. Just let it alone. This rich California soil that's on there, all I got to do is pour a little water on it. There you are. Grew a new thumb. Sam, what's this contraption? Oh, back away. That's top oh. secret. Oh, don't even look at it. Forget oh. what you've seen. That's what I've been working on for the last five days and nights. Without sleep? Without results. <laughs> oh, come now. What is it? You can tell me. No, I can't. So many of my inventions have been stolen, I can't trust anybody. Oh. Instance. Well, uh, a mixer for cement, that was mine. Cement mixer? Don't be silly. That was invented before you were born. Well, putty, putty. <laughs> How do you like that? They're steal my inventions before I can even think of them. <laughs> oh, somebody at the door. <clears throat> oh, howdy doody. How are you there, officer? Come right in, sir. Good Thank to you. see you. Uh, Mr. Cadetelhopper? Yes? Well, I'm from the U.S. Government Research Department of Aviation. Oh, I see. Well, come right in. Come right in. I've been expecting you. This is Daisy Dune, my girl. Yes. Well, my name will have to be anonymous. What's that? 
my name will have to be anonymous. It's almost as bad as Skadiddle Hopper. Huh? <laughs> Now, about your new headgear parachute, Mr. Gadiddlehopper, how does it work? Uh, well, you see, it fits inside your hat, see, and it fastens under your chin. And if the plane's in any trouble, you just grab the hat and say, Well, here we go again. Let's <laughs> uh, see. Uh, have you experimented with it? Well, yeah, my grandpa Gadiddlehopper made a jump from the barn with it the other day. He came down okay, Oh, yes, he's going down. <laughs> well, if the hat has a strap under the chin to hold it on, when the chute opens, wouldn't the sudden speed break the neck? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll, we'll put the chin strap under the arm, you see. Oh, fine. It sounds yes. much safer. Oh, yes. Well, uh, shall we make the test? Yes, I'll get the stuff and I'll jump from the top of the barn for you. <laughs> Right over there. Yes. There's the barn. Did you notice that we don't have one of those uh, weather vanes up there, one of those weather cocks? We use a macro. A macro? Yes, that way you can tell which way the wind's blowing without looking up. Oh. <laughs> well, if you don't mind, uh, shall we see the demonstration? Yes, I'll put the hat on. Now, uh, now how do I look? <laughs> like something that was swept out the back door of the automatic. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you like me. <laughs> well, I'll get up on top of the roof here. It's... Do you know what you're doing? Don't worry. I know what I'm doing. Certainly I know what I'm doing. Ready? Here I come. Now I count to ten and pull the ripcord. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> I do wish people would stop calling me for these things. Slim! Slim, are you all right? You? I thought you said you knew what you were doing. I do, but now I'm doing it with a broken neck. <laughs> Dave Rose and the orchestra and the saber dance. Thank <laughs> you.
weekly homemaker hint from Jane Masters, co-director of the Norge Home Economics Department. If your refrigerator has a big enough freezer chest, you can fix a fruit pie several days ahead of time, then bake it when you need it. But don't prick the openings in the top crust till you bake the pies, because fruit juices expand when frozen and they may run over. Plenty of room for pies and all kinds of frozen foods in the new Norge Jet Self Defroster. The cross top freezer holds up to 52 and a half pounds of frozen food. And with Norge's new Jet Self Defrosting, you don't have to juggle things around during defrosting. In fact, you can forget about defrosting, for Norge defrosts automatically every night, so fast even frozen fruits and ice creams stay brick solid. It's automatic defrosting at its finest. And why shouldn't it be? After all, Norge originated self-defrosting. And they're the world's largest manufacturers of self-defrosting refrigerators. You really should see this new Norge Jet Self Defroster, for you won't know what you're missing if you don't see Norge. Chapter 2 from the Skelton Scrapbook of Satire on Inventions is entitled, What Makes Things Go? And it stars Junior, the mean whittle kid. For the 20 blackbirds baking a pie. Now, who would ever do this thing like that? I think I'll give it a try, though. Oh, look at that big pot of glue on the pantry shelf. I think I'll take Grandpa's teeth out of the glass and glue them on top of his hat. <laughs> and that way, when he sees a pretty girl, he can tip his hat and smile without looking up. <laughs> Uh-oh, storm warnings. The big blow's coming from behind. Yes, young. What are you doing? Why are you standing like that? I'm looking at this pot of glue. Is that, is that all you're doing? Yeah, looking? I, I guess looking. Well, then come away. I can't. My eyelashes are stuck. Junior, why don't you behave yourself? It's just as easy to be good as it is to be bad. I know it is, so why shouldn't I pick the one that gives me the most fun? <laughs> hey, can I go outside and play? Yes. Yeah. Go next door and tease that big, vicious dog. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, they sure love me. Come see who's here. Who? Well, Mr. Fowler, old Snazola kid himself. Well, Junior, hello, hello, hello. Ah, shut up. <laughs> Were you over to Mr. Fowler's this morning? Junior, uh, did you see my cat? I'm glad you asked that question. You are? Yes, you could have asked me about that broken window in your car. <laughs> but I don't have a broken window in my car. You don't know me very well, do you? <laughs> oh, my. Well, everybody to his own opinion, you know. Now, uh, about my cat, did you see him? Well, I was cleaning his fur with a vacuum cleaner. See? And I went, zip, and the next thing I know, he is gone. <laughs> Well, never mind what I'm saying, but before you go to bed tonight, don't forget to put the vacuum cleaner out. <laughs> Last time I saw that vacuum cleaner, it was sitting on the fence. <laughs> Do you know why? What? I saw a football cat the other day. A football cat? Yeah. <laughs> It made nine yards last night, and it got 40 to go. Well, speaking of my cat, uh, you didn't help him get the uh, bird out of the cuckoo clock, did you? Bird out of the cuckoo clock? Yes. Now, who would do the thing like that? Well, now listen, Junior. Someone has ruined Mr. Fowler's cuckoo clock. The bird is gone. Well, maybe it has gone back to Capistrano. I'm waiting. Well, I saw the bird cuckooing at me, and it made me mad. So I thought I would get one of them cuckoo eggs, see? And then I thought maybe if it had any eggs, I could reach in the clock, and I would get one, and I could sit on it and hatch my own clock. <laughs> Well, he admits he broke it. Well, that's a good boy. I guess we'll just have to have it repaired. You mean you're not going to whip me? Well, for telling the truth, no. Certainly not. How long has this been going on? <laughs> of 
good hearing. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll fix the clock for you. No, thanks. I've got too many excess parts. Now. I know, but I is an inventor. I have his own push-button system, you see. So he can take his punishment and not waste any precious time. You see? <laughs> now, when a boy is naughty, he pushes one button and it says window breaker on it. Another one says piano crusher. And the other is a light bulb smasher. And the other is a flower pot crasher. You follow me? Oh, isn't it amazing the way children can make believe? <laughs> well, at least this way he can keep out of trouble. Well, pay attention now, kids. I got you having absolutely oh, quiet. We'll be still, Junior. Yeah. Well, you better hold on to something because I'm going to press all buttons at the same time. Yeah! Any questions? Good heavens, it worked. Yeah. Boy, you look awful silly with that flower pot on your head. Oh. Of course, Papa, he said you was half potted in it. Where's my hairbrush? Oh, no, 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 I'll get it for you. I'll get it for you. Get the hairbrush. I'm going to get the hairbrush. I'm going to get the hairbrush. I wish we'd have moved into a smaller place. Did well, you get it? here it is. All right. And, uh, I can uh, wait just a minute. I, I, I'm going to join you. So, um, I'm going to have to. I'm one page missing. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like it when we work together. It's so cold. <laughs> oh, Junior, bend over. Okay. Oh, 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 my finger, my finger. What happened? That that new hairbrush has got a mousecraft concealed in it, see? When people spank their little kids and they say, this hurts me more than it does you, this proves it, you. <laughs> Going to get it. Okay, I was waiting. Okay, I got. I be careful when you slap me in the back pocket, though, because I got uranium beans in there. <laughs> oh! You start to spank me, boy, and you'll have to finish the job up on the moon. <laughs> be no more me, because there'll be part of me here, and there'll be part of me there, and part of me there, and people will say that's him all over. <laughs> And there'll be no more junior, boy. I will be completely finished, and you... Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, good. You scared yourself. <laughs> you look a little bleached yourself. Now, get up to your room, lock yourself in, and bring me the key. Okay. <laughs> get up to your room, lock yourself in, and bring you the key. Nuts, the whole family's nuts. <laughs> Really? This house is so full of booby traps, I'm afraid to move. Well, don't worry, booby. Any... <laughs> Any... Whenever you're ready to move, just let me know. I can push a button and the whole house will move right down the street. Oh, now, Junior, you're, you're kidding me. <laughs> you keep laughing, kiddo. That <laughs> I think I'll be leaving. Yeah. No, not until you see my new air conditioner for stuffy houses. You see, I invented this myself. You see... You put it in front of the window like this, see? And the box has a spring with an arm on it, see? And it's got a little cup at the end of it. Now I put the rock in the cup like that. Now I press the lever. Feel that blade from <laughs> This is Rob O'Connor saying, remember in refrigerators, home freezers, gas, and electric ranges, washers and water heaters, everything Norge makes, Norge makes right. This week, why not make a point of stopping in at your local Norge dealers? See the beautiful new Norge Jet Self Defroster, the refrigerator that defrosts itself automatically every 24 hours, so fast, even ice cream stays solid. See the fastest and finest self-defrosting system yet designed. See the new Norge Jet Self Defroster. And now until next week, this is Red Skelton saying thanks for listening and reminding you that you won't know what you're missing if you don't see Norge.
Join us again next week for the Red Skelton Show. Red Skelton is heard in this program to the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor Studio. This is a copyrighted feature transcribed from Hollywood. That's right, folks. B for comedy, A for Abbott, M for Maxwell, E for Ennis, L for Lou Costello. Put them all together and they spell Camel. Experience is the best teacher. Try a Camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking Camels than ever before. And draw up a chair for tonight's Camel Show, starring Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. <laughs> Come over here, please. Will you listen to me? What are you writing on that pad? Hey, Emmett. What are you writing on that pad? I'm just making out a list of girls I'm going to kiss next week. Here's who I got picked out. Lizzie Schwartz, Maggie Mugglemeyer, Tessie Tinfoil, Lana Turner. Now, wait a minute. Lana Turner wouldn't kiss you. Oh, no? Oh, no. Then I'll scratch her off my list. I love you. You dummy, always thinking of girls. Girls, girls, girls. The great men don't waste their time on girls. Where do you suppose Benjamin Franklin would have been if he'd have thought of girls all of the time? In the front row at Earl Carroll's? No, no, no. <laughs> Costello, I've been telling you for the past three weeks. You've got to quit chasing girls and get yourself a job. Look at Look how sloppy you are. Look at your socks. I can't help my socks, have it. It's those new Hickok plastic garters. What's the matter with them? Your stock socks stay up, but your legs fall down. Yeah. <laughs> For Luke Costello. Here, boy. Out of the way, fatso. I'm looking for Luke Costello. The boy, he is Luke Costello. The famous Luke Costello. Certainly. The one and only Luke yes, Costello. Yes. That's me. Gee, I listen to you on the radio every Thursday night. You break me up when you say, How do you do? Wait a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute. That ain't me. That's the mad Russian. You're saying? I'm right. <laughs> Who's going to take this telegram? I'll take, I'll take it. it. It's collect $14. He'll, He'll take, take it. it. <laughs> oh, give it to me. Here, boy. Hey, Costello. This telegram is from Joe DiMaggio. Listen to this. Dear Lou, as you know, I am recovering from a foot operation. I would appreciate you, appreciate you taking my place. Appreciate you taking my place on New York Yankees until I recover. Please report to the Yankee Stadium immediately. Signed, Joe DiMaggio. Have it. Hey, that's one of those. That's the news I've been waiting for. I'm going to be a big league ball player. Yes, DiMaggio probably heard about my playing with the Cucamonga Wildcats last year. You a ball player? I don't believe it, Costello. You know nothing about ball. Oh no, I eat baseball. I live baseball. All night when I'm asleep, I dream about baseball. Don't you ever dream about girls? What? And miss my turn up at bat? Oh. <laughs> Yes. And another thing, Abbott. What page are you on? Never mind what page you're on. Okay. Another thing, Abbott. Not only that, in Patterson, New Jersey, I worked out with a baseball team. I used to stay out till 4 o'clock in the morning. Why did you stay out till 4 o'clock in the morning? This was a girls' baseball team. <laughs> Gosh, Stella, if you're going to play with the New York Yankees, if you really have to know something about big league baseball, Lou. I know all about baseball. All right. Suppose there's a left-handed pitcher pitching. What do you do? I put in a right-handed batter. Now, suppose there's a right-handed pitcher pitching. I put in a left-handed batter. But now I trick you. I take out the right-handed pitcher and put in a left-handed pitcher. Then I double-cross you. I take out my left-handed batter and put in a right-handed batter. Now, wait a minute. Where are you getting all those right-handed batters? The same place where you're getting all those left-handed pitchers. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Bud. Hello, Lewis, honey. It's, uh, it's Marilyn Maxwell. <laughs> Hello, Marilyn. I've got great news. I'm going to play ball with the New York Yankees. I'm taking you along as a pitcher. Oh, now, Costello, Marilyn Maxwell can't pitch. Oh, no? You should see all the guys she struck out that were trying to get the first base. Ah, oh, no. <laughs> This kid has got some nice curves. <laughs> oh, Lewis, you're so sweet. But I do hope you be careful. You know, big league baseball is a very dangerous game. Oh, what's dangerous about baseball, Marilyn? Well, I read in the paper this morning that in the opening game in Boston, five players died on base. <laughs> Marilyn, you don't seem to know much about baseball. 
Let me show you how to play indoor baseball. First, I put my left arm around your waist. Then I snuggle my head on your shoulder like this. Then I press my cheek against your cheek. Oh, wait a minute, Costello. Well, that's not the way to play indoor baseball. How do you like that? Every season, new rules. <laughs> Goodbye and good luck, Lewis. I just know you'll become famous for those New York Yankees. Marilyn's right, Thank Costello. You, this is Thank your you. chance to become famous. Now, you've got a good job as a baseball player. Then you might find your proper niche in life. Yes, I might. I mean, after all, if I find my... What will I find? A niche, a niche. You'll find your niche. Yeah, but when I find an itch, I scratch it. No. <laughs> what in the world are you talking about? An itch. I once had the seven-year itch. What happened? I scratched real fast and got rid of it in three and a half years. <laughs> I'm not talking about that kind of an itch. I mean an itch in life. A niche in life is what everyone is looking for. Anyone who is successful has found a niche. Oh, well, if that's the case, I know an Airedale that is doing very well. Uh, well that... <laughs> Listen to me, Costello. When I say a niche, I don't mean a niche like you have when you have an itch. No. I mean a niche like you have when you have a notch. Oh, you don't mean an itch like a niche when you have a niche. You mean a niche like you have when you have a notch. Now you've got it. Now I've got it. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Costello, why do you mash everything up like that? You're the most mixed-up man I ever saw. Well, maybe it's because I fell on my mother's mix master this morning. She had a set for mashed potatoes. Oh. <laughs> I'm all mother. I know that. I'm an idiot. All I'm trying to tell you is that a niche is a notch. Catch? Notch. Notch. All right. Now, you know that a niche is a notch. Uh, you know that both of them are the same. Yes. Now, I could have a notch and you could have a niche. Yes. Niche to me and notch to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only trying to impress you the importance of being a big, big league ball player. And having a good income. Did you ever draw a nice big fat salary? No, I never drew a fat salary, but I once sketched a skinny tomato. No, no, no. no. <laughs> so when I say draw, I don't mean draw like you draw when you draw. I mean draw like you draw when you draw a salary. Have it. Let me smell your breath. Mm-hmm. Just as I thought. You've drawn one too many already. <laughs> Can you listen to me, please? When I say you draw a salary, I mean you draw money. Now he's got me drawing money. Wait till the FBI finds out about this. I'll probably draw 20 years in a clink. And they don't feed you any salary in there, either. Costello, <laughs> when I say you draw money, I mean you draw like you draw money to spend it. Not, not like when you draw on an easel. That's what I always say. With money, it's easel come, easel go. No, no, no. <laughs> Everybody draws money. I draw money. I've been drawing money for years. My brother draws money. He's been drawing money for years. You draw, and your brother draws? Certainly. Just as I thought. You and your brother are an old pair of drawers. <laughs> Experience is the best teacher. It happened shortly after the end of the war. Two cigarettes glow in the dusk on the veranda of a country house as a man and woman are chatting. The woman remarks... Robert, you've changed your cigarette brand. This is a camel. I can tell without even looking. Yes, I have changed my brand. You know how we smoked whatever cigarettes we could get during the war? <laughs> Don't I? Yes, I must have tried all the brands during that shortage. And that's when I found I liked camels best. And weren't you right? Yes, experience is the best teacher. During the wartime shortage... People smoked whatever cigarettes they could get. It was this experience that taught millions the differences in cigarette quality. As smokers tried cigarette after cigarette on their T-zones, that's T for taste and T for throat, it was Camel's rich, full flavor and cool mildness that stood out from all the others. The result? Today, more people smoke Camel's than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a Camel. <laughs> While you light up a camel, here's Skinny Ennis with Linda. When I go to sleep, I never count sheep. I count all the charms about Linda. Lately it seems, in all of my dreams, I walk with my arms about Linda. But what good does it do me? For Linda doesn't know I exist. Can't help feeling gloomy Think of all the loving I've missed We pass on the street My heart skips a beat I say to myself, how long, Linda? If only she'd smile I'd stop her a while And then I would get to know Linda But miracles still happen And when my lucky star begins to shine with one lucky break, I'll make Linda mine. 
on the street, my heart skips a beat. I say to myself, hello, Linda. If only she'd smile, I'd stop her a while. And then I would get to know Linda. But miracles still happen. And when my lucky star begins to shine, with one lucky prayer, I'll make Linda mine. a big uh, league ball player, you've got to get yourself in shape. Now, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., you lift weights. From 9 to 10, deep knee bends. 10 to 11, skip rope. 11 to 12, run five miles. 12 to 1, I'll never make it. Hey, look! <laughs> you idiot, you'll never be a ball player. Staying up late and going to nightclubs, eating rich food, running around with beautiful girls. Do you know what can happen to you? Yes, I can become manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. I... <laughs> I don't even know why DiMaggio picked you. You don't even know how to swing a bat. I know all about swinging bats. When I was a kid, my father used to hit me with a baseball bat. My brother used to hit me with a baseball bat. My Uncle Artie Stebbins used to hit me with a baseball bat. And my mother used to hit me with a tennis racket. With a tennis racket? Yes, she didn't like baseball. <laughs> Hiya, fellas. Well, oh, well, well, it's Gideon. Us. Hey, Costello, I heard about you taking uh, Joe DiMaggio's place for the New York Yankees. That's right. You know, I used to pitch for the Hollywood Stars. And boy, I'll never forget my last game. There were five men on base. Oh, oh no, wait, 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 Five men on base. Now, that's impossible. Did you ever see the Hollywood stars play? Ennis, I... <laughs> I've seen the Hollywood stars, and I don't remember you. Oh, I've changed a lot since then. I had the biggest buck teeth you ever saw. I was the only man on the team that could slide into second base and spike you from either end. <laughs> well, so long, Fatso. <laughs> so long, Skinny. So long. Hey, you know that skinny would make an ugly skeleton? All right. <laughs> well, tell it, don't waste time with him. Now, you've got to get ready for the opening game. Yes, I think we're going to play the Cleveland Indians. Cleveland Indians, eh? Uh-huh. Feller pitching? Certainly there's a feller pitching. <laughs> Who do you think they'd use, a girl? Oh, I, I know they don't use a girl. I said feller pitching. What feller? Feller with the Cleveland Indians. Look, Abbott, there's nine guys on the Cleveland team. Now, which feller are you talking about? <laughs> feller that pitches. There is only one feller with Cleveland. You mean nine Yankees are going to play against one fella? That's right. You mean there's no fellas in the outfield? No. And there's no fellas in the infield? No. Cleveland only has one fella. Well, this fella must be pretty good if, if they don't need, he don't need any other players but himself. Look, all the players will be out there helping him. You just said there was only one fella on the team. That's right. Then where did all them other fellas come from? Oh, you idiot. When I say there's only one fella on the team, I mean there is only one fella that pitches. Well, Abbott, when the manager of the team wants this pitcher, what does he call him? Feller. You mean he just hollers, hey, feller! And this guy knows that they mean him? That's right. <laughs> His name is Feller, Feller, Bob Feller. And when I say there is only one feller on the team that pitches, that's it. And the feller that pitches is Feller. There's only the other fellers on the team, uh, but there's uh, only one feller. Boy, are you mixed up. <laughs> Oh, you mean the feller that pitches is feller. And there's other fellas on the team, but they're not fellers? Now you grasp it. Yes, I grasp it, but it keeps slipping out of my hand. <laughs> let's, let's go into this sporting goods store and get your baseball equipment. I want you to look right for the opening game. Now, go ahead and ask that lady there where they keep the baseball uniform. Uh, pardon me, miss. Well, if it isn't Mr. Albert. Hello. And Mr. Costello. Hello. You fought a little man, you. <laughs> what are you doing in the sporting goods store, miss? Oh, I just soaked in to get a gift for my nephew. I'm buying him a boss ball. Ball. Boss ball? ball? <laughs> Abbott, you know what a boss ball is? That's what the poacher throws to the coocher. <laughs> and the booter tries to boot a home run. <laughs> My, uh, my nephew is just a lotto chope, but his ambition is to be a Brooklyn doger caucher. Well, if he's only a little guy, why don't he join the deep troop tookers and be a short stoop? <laughs> well, I must be going. As we say in Chinese, Gish a gooey hop dooey, I'm pushed back to you. And a fish of gooey chop suey and a push to you, too. <laughs> Oh, good morning, boys. As Johnny Weissmuller said to Buster Crab, what dive did you come out of? <laughs> well, my friend and I are here to get some baseball equipment. Uh, I'd like to see a baseball uniform that would fit Costello. 
So would I. <laughs> Look, as Adam said to Eve, quit ribbing me. <laughs> However, I'll do the best I can. We'll start with the spiked shoes. What size do you wear? Eight. Oh, let me see. I've only got one pair left, and they're size five. Maybe you can squeeze into them, Costello. Go ahead and try. Okay. <laughs> what do you know? Open-toed baseball shoes. <laughs> now for the uniform. My, you're certainly a pudgy little rascal, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Aren't you overweight? I'm about 120 pounds overweight, but I'm going back to my normal weight. Yes, what's normal? 60 pounds overweight. <laughs> Gosh, Shelly, you should really go on a diet. Yeah, of course you know what a diet is, don't you? Oh, sure. That's where you can eat all you want of everything you don't like. <laughs> Young man, if you really want to reduce, why don't you exercise with a couple of dumbbells? Okay, I'm ready whenever you and have it all. All right. <laughs> your baseball equipment. Mister, do you have any bats? Oh, certainly. Here's a fine bat. Autographed by Slaughter of the Cardinals. This bat was made for Slaughter. Ain't you got one that was made for baseball? (laughs) When he says Slaughter, he means Slaughter the baseball player. Slaughter the baseball player? With that bat, you could slaughter anybody. (laughs) No, no, Costello. I'm talking about Slaughter. Everybody knows Slaughter. He knows Slaughter. Well, maybe he knows Slaughter, but I don't know him. Uh, you idiot. Everybody knows Slaughter, the baseball player. Slaughter is the man's last name. What's his first name? He knows. Now, there's a clever guy. He knows his first name. Oh, well, forget about the bat. Look, mister, do you have a baseball cap that will fit Costello's head? What size pencil sharpener does he wear? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, a baseball cap. Oh, yes, here's a dandy. This is the kind fellow wears. What fella? The fella with the Cleveland Indians. There's nine players with the Cleveland Indians. Which fella are you talking about? Oh, young man, when I say fella with the Cleveland Indians, I am only referring to one fella. The fella that pitches with the Cleveland Indians. When you say the fella with the Cleveland Indians, you're only referring to one fella. The fella that pitches for the Cleveland Indians. Yeah. As Orville said to Wilbur, you're right. <laughs> How do you like that? Now they're doing our routines in sporting good stores. Oh, forget about him, Custer. Hey, wait a minute. I've got an idea. Mrs. Wetwash's late husband used to be a big league ba- ball player. Now, he was a home run king, in other words. Now, maybe she'll give you one of his bats for good luck. Let's go over to her house and ask her. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll go right over now, huh? You're right, Abbott. As John Adams said to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow... How do you like that? I forgot what John Adams said to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. <laughs> Well, good morning, Mrs. Wetwash. Oh, hello, Mr. Abbott. Oh, my, you know you ought to muzzle that St. Bernard dog. <laughs> oh, pardon me, it's Costello. <laughs> and tell me, Costello, how are things in Gawker, moron? <laughs> Mrs. Wetwash, I wish you hadn't said that. I was just telling Abbott, your face reminds me of a rose. Oh, really? An American beauty rose? No, a rhinoceros. <laughs> Costello. Mrs. Wetwash, Costello's leaving for New York to join uh, Joe DiMaggio's play. Take Joe's place. Isn't that wonderful? He's going to play with the Yanks. Oh, I can't believe it. Yes? What do those big Yanks bomb with a little jerk like him? <laughs> Mrs. Wetwash, that was an insult. I'll have you know that beautiful women find me irresistible. <laughs> I don't find you irresistible. And I don't find you beautiful. <laughs> Quiet, Costello. Ask her for those baseball bats her husband left her. Okay. Mrs. Whitwash, I understand when your husband was alive, he had a lot of old bats. That's a lie. He never went out with anybody but me. No, 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 no. no, 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 no Mrs. Whitwash. Costello means your husband's uh, baseball bats. You yes. see, he thought you might give him one of them. Yes, that's right, Mrs. Whitwash. You see, I need a good bat. Oh, you need a good bat. I'll be glad to help you out. Can I have the bat right now? Right now. Oh, <laughs> me! Lovely Marilyn Maxwell for Metro Golden Mayor, producers of The Sea of Grass. For camel fans everywhere in honor of New Orleans Jazz Week, Marilyn sings for the first time on the air the title song of the picture, New Orleans. Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans and miss it each night and day? I know I'm not wrong, not feeling getting stronger the longer I stay away. It's the moss covered vines, the tall sugar pines, where mockingbirds used to sing. And I'd like to see the lazy Mississippi a hurrying in. A creole tune that fills the air I dream of 
about magnolias in June, and soon I'm wishing that I were there. Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans when that's where you left your heart? And there's something more. According to a recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Three leading independent research organizations asked this question of 113,597 doctors. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Now, you probably enjoy rich, full flavor and cool mildness in a cigarette just as much as doctors do. And that's why, if you're not a camel smoker now... Try a camel on your T-zone. That's T for taste and T for throat. Your true proving ground for any cigarette. See if camel's rich flavor of superbly blended choice tobaccos isn't extra delightful to your taste. See if camel's cool mildness isn't in harmony with your throat. See if you too don't say camels suit my T-zone to a T. <laughs> Well, Costello, I'm going to New York with you. You know, Bucky Harris, the Yanks manager, gave me a job as coach for as long as you're on the team. Look at it. If you're a coach, you must know all the players. I certainly do. Well, you know, I, mean, I never met the guys, so you'll have to tell me their names, and then I'll know who's playing on the team. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you their names, but you know, strange it may seem, they give these ball players nowadays very peculiar names. You mean funny names? Strange names, pet names, like Dizzy Dean and brother Daffy, Daffy Dean. I'm their French cousin. French? Gouffet. Gouffet Dean. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, let's see, we have on the bags, we have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find I out. I say, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Are you the manager? Yes. You're going to be the coach, too? Yes. And you know the fellow's name? Well, I should. Well, then who's on first? Yes. I mean, the fellow's name. Oh. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who? The guy playing first. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell That's me. That's it. That's who? Yes. <laughs> Look, you got a first baseman. Certainly. Who's playing first? That's right. When you pay off the first baseman every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. <laughs> All I'm trying to find out is the fellow's name on first base. Who? The guy that gets the That's money. That's it. Who gets the money on he first base? He does. Every dollar. Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's wife? Yes. <laughs> With that. Look, what I want to know is when you sign up the first baseman, how does he sign his name to the Who? contract? The guy. Who? How does he sign his That's name? That's how he signs it. Who? Yes. <laughs> All I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? No, what is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? One base at a time. Well, don't change the plate. I'm not changing nobody. Take it easy, buddy. I'm only asking you who's the guy on first base? That's right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Name on first base. No, what is on second? I'm not asking you who's on who's second. Who's on first? I don't know. Oh, he's on third. We're not talking about him. Now, <laughs> now, how did I get on third base? Why, you mentioned his name. If I mention a third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? What's on first? What's on second? I don't know. He's on third. There I go. Thank on third again. <laughs> Now, who's playing third base? Why do you insist on putting who on third base? What am I putting on third? Oh, what is on second? You know what? Who on second? Who is on first? I don't know. Third, third base? base. <laughs> Look, you got outfield? Sure. The left fielder's name. Why? I just thought I'd ask. Well, I just thought I'd tell you. Now, tell me who's playing left field. Who is playing first? I'm not staying out of the infield. <laughs> What's the guy's name in left field? Oh, what is on second? I'm not asking you who's on who's second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third, Third base. base. <laughs> and the left fielder's name? Why? Because. Oh, he's center field. Be <laughs> this Look, look, look. You got a pitcher on a team? Sure. The pitcher's name? Tomorrow. You don't want to tell me today? I'm telling you, then man. Go ahead. Tomorrow. What time? What time what? What time tomorrow? You're going to tell me who's pitching. Now, listen. Who is not pitching? I'll who break is... your arm, you say. Who's on first? <laughs> What's on second? I don't know. Third base. Got a catcher? Certainly. The catcher's name. Today. Today. And tomorrow's pitch. Now you've got it. All we got is a couple of days on the list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a 
I'll catch you, too. No, they don't. I get behind the plate, do some fancy catching. Tomorrow's pitching on my team and a heavy hitter gets up. Yes. Now, the heavy hitter bunts the ball. When he bunts the ball, me being a good catcher, I'm going to throw the guy out of first base, so I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you've said right. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's all you have to do. Just to throw the ball at first base. Yes. Now, who's got it? Naturally. <laughs> If I throw the ball at first base, somebody's got to get it. Now, who has it? Naturally. Who? Naturally. Naturally? Naturally. So I pick up the ball and I throw it to naturally. No, you don't. You throw the ball to who? Naturally. That's the... That's what I say. You're not saying that. I throw the ball to naturally. You throw it to who? Naturally. That's it. That's what I said. Listen, you ask me. I throw the ball to who? Naturally. Now, you ask me. You throw the ball to who? Naturally. That's it. Same as you. <laughs> don't change the ball. Same as you. Yeah, I throw the ball to who? Whoever it is drops the ball and the guy runs a second. Yes. Who picks up the ball and throws it to what? What throws it to I don't know? I don't know. Throws it back to tomorrow? Triple play. Yes. Another guy gets up and it's a long fly ball to be caught. Why? I don't know. He's on third and I don't give a darn. Well, what? I said I don't give a darn. Oh, that's our shortstop. I mean, it is. Oh. <laughs> Just a moment for a Camel cigarette. During the war, the makers of Camel cigarettes sent a total of more than 150 million free Camels to our fighting men overseas. Now free Camels are sent to servicemen's hospitals instead. This week, the Camels go to Veterans Hospital, Fort Lyon, Colorado, USAF Station Hospital, Davis, Mountain Field, Tucson, Arizona, U.S. Naval Hospital, Quantico, Virginia, U.S. Marine Hospital, Baltimore, Maryland, and Veterans Hospital, Palo Alto, California. Camel broadcasts go out to the United States three times a week. Are rebroadcast to practically every area in the world where men are still stationed and to our good neighbors in Central and South America. And now back to Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Uh, what is that, Lou, you've got in your hand there? Another telegram? Hey, Abbott, look, I just got a telegram from Joe DiMaggio. Well, go ahead and read it. Okay. Dear Lou, just heard your show. I think you have the makings of the world's greatest natural ball player. You have spiked teeth, a club head, and you've been off your base for years. Good night. <laughs> good night, folks. Good night, everybody, and a special good night to Joe DiMaggio. Get well quick, Joe. This is Abbott and Costello again next Thursday night when Costello is going to build himself a new prefabricated house. You can imagine the trouble he'll get at you. I don't know whether it'll be a one-story house or a two-story house, but anyway, that's another story. Prince Albert Pipe Appeal. They're one and the same thing. Any tobacco burns, makes smoke, but where else can you find the tobacco that has the pipe appeal of Prince Albert? The coolness, mildness, the rich, full flavor. Prince Albert is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Crim cut to smoke slow and cool. So pack your pipe with mellow, rich PA. Enjoy Pipe Appeal with Prince Albert. And while we're speaking of enjoying yourself, be sure to tune in on Grand Ole Opry on NBC Saturday night. You all know and love the songs of America, but this week you have something extra special in store for you. Red Foley and his guests, Ernest Tubb and Roy Acuff. Grand Ole Opry Saturday night on NBC. Be sure to tune in next week for another great Abbott and Costello show brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. And remember, experience is the best teacher. Try a Camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking Camels than ever before. See? A-M-A-L-S. Abbott and Costello's famous baseball routine, Who's On First, is now available at Phonograph Records. This is Michael Roy in Hollywood wishing you all a pleasant good night for Camel. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is milk. M-I-L-K. Really? You bet your life! The DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America present Groucho Marx in You Bet Your Life, the comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. And here he is... The one, the only... Anybody got a dime for a cup of coffee? Oh, that's me, Groucho Marx! Thank you. Well, here I am again with $1,500 for one of our couples tonight. George Fenneman, who's face to try for? A couple about to be married, Groucho. 
They were selected by our studio audience just before we went on the air. And here they are, Miss Marie Fortin and Mr. Harry Chauze. Meet Groucho Marx. Welcome for the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers, youngsters. And if one of you says the secret word, he wins $100 in cash instantly. It's a common word, something you'll uh, find around the house. Mary uh, Fortin, is that... Uh... Fort- Fortin. <laughs> Harry uh, Chauze, is that right? Chauze. Chauze. Huh? Where are you from, Harry? I'm from Salix, Iowa. Where's that? Uh, near? Any place? Oh, next Sioux City. <laughs> Why did you leave your hometown there, Harry? I would have come out to the west. Well, was it a good move when you left? Oh, I think so. I met Marie by coming out here. Well, answer my question. Was it a good move when you left? <laughs> I made a mistake when I left my hometown. If I hadn't made the mistake, I wouldn't have had to leave. <laughs> So you two are going to get hooked up, huh? Yeah. Well, that, that's very nice, huh? What kind of work do you do, Harry? I'm a machinist in Arabian American Oil Company, Saudi Arabia. You going over there, over there? Yes, we're going back over there. How did you meet Superman here, uh, Marie? Well, I met him in the first grade. We went to school together. And never had another fellow from the first grade up to now? Oh, yes. <laughs> you just took him as a last resort, is that it? <laughs> What, what about you, Harry? Have you had any other girls in the uh, interim between the first grade and Arabia? No. no. <laughs> That's the most lying laugh I've ever seen. <laughs> Did she accept you immediately after you worked up enough courage to propose, uh, Harry? No, not right away. You had to squeeze it out of her, huh? <laughs> Remember the circumstances of his big love scene, Marie? Uh, well, he took me dancing to various places around the city. And, uh, well, he didn't ask me to marry him. He asked me if I wanted to go to Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> That's certainly a roundabout proposal if I ever heard of it. <laughs> Driving, I must try that sometime. <laughs> Driving with a guy on the car and you say, I'd just like to go to Arabia. <laughs> and? What is there about Romeo that caused you to fall in love with him? Oh, his charming personality. <laughs> Could you give us an example of your personality? <laughs> just stood and grinned at her, eh? <laughs> well, he seems like a very nice fellow, Marie. Now, what do you like about Marie, Harry? Mm, I guess it's her sense of humor. She has a good sense of humor? How do you know? She always laughs at my jokes. <laughs> How do you know she's laughing at your jokes? <laughs> How do you know it isn't the string on her corset that's tickling her? Huh? <laughs> Does that exactly. ever occur to you, Harry? Huh? I don't think she wears a corset. <laughs> You don't think she wears a corset? Eh? You're taking this girl all the way to Arabia and you're not sure whether she wears a corset? <laughs> well, you've aroused my curiosity. I'll never rest until I hear you tell a joke. Could you, uh, could you tell us a small joke? Mm, I don't believe I know any small ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a wow, huh? Yeah. Did you ever hear the one about the fellow that played on the girls' basketball team? Well, that's pretty good. I like that, huh? <laughs> Is that the sort of thing you laugh at, Marie? You're supposed to say, how, how can a fellow play on a girls' basketball team? Oh, I see there's more to it, huh? <laughs> okay, how can a fellow play on a girls' basketball team? He lied about his age. <laughs> That'll certainly kill him in Arabia, then. <laughs> Are you going to be the jealous type of wife, Marie? No, I don't think so. You won't mind if he steps out with another gal occasionally, huh? Yeah? Oh, he wouldn't do that. <laughs> Suppose you're sitting home all alone and uh, Harry is waking late at the office. You're watching the television matches on the uh, machine, huh? And suddenly you see Harry in the first row at the wrestling matches with a beautiful babe. What would you do? Well, that's impossible. <laughs> Why is it impossible? 
we don't have television. <laughs> this is beginning to sound like Bynes and Allen. <laughs> Marie, forget the television set. Suppose Harry's waking late and you go over to the Palladium and there's Harry dancing with a pretty blonde. What would you do? Oh, I'd walk up to him and ask him to explain. <laughs> well, that's very logical. There's only one thing that puzzles me. What are you doing at the Palladium while he's... <laughs> well, you're both very nice kids and in as much as you'll soon be married, in just one minute you're going to have a chance to make $1,500. Yes, tomorrow is a great day at all DeSoto Plymouth dealers. The brilliant new DeSoto is now on display, and the great Plymouth goes on display for the first time tomorrow. The great new Plymouth is a sensational new high for value in the low-priced field. But you be the judge. Look at it. Then climb into it and get the feel of this car. Put it up hills and through traffic. Give it the toughest test you know. And as for value... You'll find this good-looking royal riding car is packed with value and ready to prove it. Ignition key starting, improved air pillow ride, the quick true stops of safeguard hydraulic brakes, the lively power of the high compression engine, and many other features exclusive with the great new Plymouth. Now, more than ever, Plymouth is the car that likes to be compared. For beautiful new styling, for roomy comfort, for easy riding and wonderful handling, for dollar for dollar value. So meet your new Plymouth, the American beauty, tomorrow at your DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Now let's see if a couple of youngsters about to be married are going to get the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question. Fenneman, explain the rules. Each of our three couples has $20. They bet as much of that 20 as they want on each of four questions. The couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the $1,500 DeSoto Plymouth question at the end of the show. Our other two couples are in a waiting room off stage, so they don't know what's happening out here. Here we go. Let's see how high you can build your $20. You selected initials of organizations as your category. Is that right? Here's your first question. You have $20. How much are you going to risk? $5. What educational organization do the initials PTA stand for? Parent-Teacher Association. That's right. Parent-Teachers Association. <laughs> Well, they're on their way, Groucho. They have $25. Ah, you're swinging along. You got $25. How much of the 25 are you going to try? Ten. What government body does AEC stand for? Atomic Energy Commission. Well, you're just wonderful, Marie. Huh? <laughs> they're climbing now, Groucho. They have $35. Here's your third question. You got 35 How much are you going to try? Fifteen. Fifteen. $15. For what informative organization do the initials INS stand for? I-N-S. Take a stab. I don't believe I know that. No, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's uh, International News Service. They now have $20, Groucho. All right, you now got $20. Here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the 20 are you going to try now? 20. What labor organization do the initial CIO stand for? Congressional Industrial... Organization. That's close enough. Congress of Industrial Organizations is close enough. And they wind up with a total of $40. Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Now, don't sneak off to Arabia yet. You still might get the chance at the big question. Groucho, the, yes, secret, George? the secret word is still milk. Perhaps our next couple will say it. And just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected a house mover, Mr. Ab Wilson... And his partner is a housewife, Mrs. Pat Johnson. And here they are. Folks, meet Groucho Marx. Welcome to You Bet Your Life. And if one of you says the secret word, he wins $100 in cash instantly. It's a common word, something you'll find around the house. A house mover and a, and a housewife, eh? Mrs. Uh, Johnson. Uh, I'll, I'll bet you're the housewife. Is, is that right? That's right. <laughs> and where are you from, Mrs. Johnson? I'm from Denver, Colorado. You must be the house mover, eh? Huh? Yeah, I'm the house mover. I'm the big boy. <laughs> Ab, Ab Wilson is... That's uh, right. What does Ab stand for? Is that Abe? That's Ab. Uh, that's Ab. You well, I never heard that. that name. Is that a, a derivative of Abe or uh, yeah. Abner or what? Uh, well, I guess it would be, you know, you take a house move with it. The less material you have, the better off you are, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, what, what is a house mover? Do you move houses? Or? Yes, sir. You move whole houses? Whole houses, yes, sir. Where are you from, Ab? Walks to Hatchie, Texas. Walks Is that near Nacogdoches? <laughs> What is the biggest uh, hazard in your profession? Is it housemaid's knee? Uh... Well, no. It's uh, going over, up or down a hill, you know, and get break loose, you know, and get away. And what do you do when they break loose? You stand there with your fingers in your ears and your no. eyes closed? You... <laughs> what happens to the occupants uh, when you move a house? Do they just pitch a tent by the side of the road and uh, well, no, until no, you're through? They, no, they can live right on in the house. It's... <laughs> Suppose they're moving in a house and the husband is still in the, in the bathtub. Well, I'll take him right along. You don't spill no water. He might step right out of the tub into the lobby of the Biltmore Hotel. <laughs> How long have you been moving houses? About 40 years. Mm -hmm. Can you can you move any building? Yes, sir. Could you move the Empire State well, Building uh, in Chicago? I could if it wasn't for the wind. To... You could move the Empire State Building in Chicago? If it wasn't for the wind, yes. It wouldn't be easy, you know. It's in New York, the building. <laughs> It doesn't make it be a little windy. Well, I suppose many unusual things happen to you oh, in your business. Oh, right? yes. Could yes, you uh, could you remember any outstanding experience well, that you care to relate? Uh, no more than I got to move the house on the wrong house on the wrong <laughs> house on the wrong lot, you know. Robert, what was that? You? I could move the <clears throat> house on the wrong lot. Not exactly the wrong lot. I just got the wrong house on the, uh, on, uh, the house on the wrong lot. See? What do you mean? You moved the lot over to the wrong house? I moved it to the wrong lot. Then I had to get it off before the man caught me, you know. Well, let's start over again, okay. huh? Okay. Could you move the Empire State Building in Chicago? I could if it wasn't for the wind. Yeah. Even though it's in Cleveland? What's the difference? Well, thanks to you, Ab. I know all about house moving. Okay, now you two are going to get a chance to play your bet your life for fifteen hundred dollars. You run your twenty dollars into more than the other couples, and you get a chance at the Big DeSoto Plymouth question later. Fenneman's offstage remind our listeners how much the first couple won. The couple about to be married won forty dollars. Here we go. Let's see how high you can build your twenty dollars. You selected famous dogs as your category. Is that right? Now here's your first question. You have twenty dollars. How much do you want to bet? And talk right up. Ten dollars. Okay. What's the name of the famous collie dog that stars in motion pictures? Uh, Scotty. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The answer is Lassie. They now have ten dollars. How much of the ten dollars will you try? Five. What's the name of Blondie and Dagwood's dog? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry. It's well, Daisy. I wanted nursery rhymes, but oh. that had already been taken. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, that's a shame. They now have five dollars, Groucho. Well, you've only got five dollars. And here's your third question. How much of the five will you try? Three. What's the name of Mickey Mouse's dog? Mm -hmm. Do you know? Don't they have any dogs in Denver? <laughs> the dog's name is Pluto. They now have two dollars, Groucho. Well, now you're only down to two dollars. How much of the two dollars are you going to try? One dollar, I guess. One dollar. <laughs> All right. What's the name of the late President Roosevelt's... of, the, of late President Roosevelt's little Scotty? Now, that's been the papers for a long time. <laughs> Well, I, I'm sorry. It's Fella. I'm going to give you one more chance to make some money. It's not going to be uh, so easy. So think hard now and no help, please. Who is buried in Grant's tomb? Grant. General Grant is right. <laughs> Thanks and good luck from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Now, it won't be long before we know who's going to earn the chance at the $1,500 DeSoto Plymouth question. George, who's leading at this point? The young couple are ahead with $40, and the secret word is still milk. Just before we went on the air, we went looking through our studio audience for the parents of the most children. And here come the mother and the father who were chosen. Mr. and Mrs. Marion D. Story meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, youngsters, for the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers. <laughs> and if you say the secret word, you win 100 bucks in cash instantly. It's a common word, something you'll find around the house. Mr. and Mrs. Marion D. Story. Marion? Which one of you is Marion? Oh. I am. I thought you were already married. Uh... <laughs> well, that was a whirlwind courtship, eh? <laughs> Mrs. Story, your, your first name is, is Charlotte, is that right? That's right. Charlotte, huh? Where, where, where are you from, Charlotte? 
Uh, Bakersfield, California, about 100 miles north from here. Marion, what do you do for a living? I'm a sign painter. Sign painter, huh? How'd you meet Indian sign here, Charlotte? <laughs> oh, I met him on a boat, and it was raining real hard this night. And uh, he uh, said, would you share your umbrella with me? And I said, sure. And so... Uh, <laughs> And so, uh, That's a pretty corny approach there, Mary. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> How long have you kids been married? 28 years. Well, you're a fine-looking couple. Now, Mr. Story, according to Fenneman, you two are up here because you're the parents of the largest family. Is, is that correct? I well, guess I am. Yes, <laughs> it is. You mean you only guess you have a large family? <laughs> No. I mean, haven't you counted the livestock lately? <laughs> well, there's no question about the family. Uh, it's just a question why you're up here, huh? <laughs> Mrs. Story, how many times have you been a mother? Twenty times. Is this really true? Twenty uh, children, Marion? That is true. Twenty. Just what she said. Yeah. Uh, apparently nothing's happened in the last few seconds, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mr. Story, my hat, if it was on, would now be off to you. You're a remarkable woman, huh? Tell me, Popsicle, uh, <laughs> when you see a lot of kids around your house, uh, how do you know if they're all yours? I remember faces. <laughs> you never forget a face, eh? <laughs> Could you give us the names? Could you reel them off for me? Uh... Well, I'll start with the twins. There's Jean and Jane and Jimmy and Jeanette and Gary and Sherry and Eileen and Arlene. That's twins. Four sets of twins. Mm-hmm. There's two sets of uh, girl twins, and there's two sets of mixed twins. Mixed twins, huh? Yeah. Oh, and the others all goes by the name of Jean and Jane and Jack and Jacqueline and June and so on and so forth. <laughs> <laughs> How old are the children, uh, Mrs. Story? Well, the oldest is uh, from 27 to 3 years old. Mm. Have you ever thought of adopting any children? <laughs> no, it never occurred to me. <laughs> Tell me, Pop, with each new kid, do you go around passing out cigars? Well, I used to. I stopped at about a dozen. <laughs> what do you You pass out yourself now, is that it? <laughs> well, tell me, Pop. Pop, that's the understatement of the year. Uh, Paul Bunyan. Uh, if you can't remember all the names, how do you know who to call when you want something? Uh, well, if I want one of the boys, I just say, Son? <laughs> Aren't you afraid of getting trampled in the rush? <laughs> I know. Now, what kind of living quarters do you have? The Hotel Bakersfield? No, we have uh, two acres. And we have a ten-room house and uh, two showers and a bath. And... and do you have a cop in the hallway directing traffic? <laughs> Well, with all these income tax deductions, uh, how do you make out around March 15th, Pop? Well, I haven't paid income tax for a year. <laughs> you wouldn't want to loan me about eight kids, huh? <laughs> how do you manage to feed 20 kids? Uh, do you do it in shifts? Well, that's easy. I have a budget and... Um... I buy everything wholesale, and, and <laughs> I start breakfast at 5 o'clock in the morning. I get all the working ones off to work, and then uh, I've got uh, ten, 10 to get off for school, and, and I got some home, and I finally get through about 7 o'clock at night. And then What's your grocery bill amount to every week, uh, Charlotte? That's not it, too uh, uh, personal a question. Well, it runs to $100 a week. And, um, Suppose the family's having lunch on Sunday. What would you ordinarily find on the table? Well, Besides a few of the you. children, huh? <laughs> the children are all there. Well, I'll take uh, Thanksgiving Day. Well, uh, 
We had uh, two 30-pound turkeys, and uh, we had 20 pounds of roast chicken, and uh, we had a gallon of mashed potatoes, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, 14 pumpkin pies, and eight mince pies, and six cranberry pies, and gallons pie. of salads. And, <laughs> and what do you use for a toothpick? A redwood log? <laughs> Marion, tell me, as the father of 20 kids, have you had any unusual or unforgettable experience? <laughs> I've had lots of unusual experiences. Uh, we were living in Sacramento, and coming into the hospital, we had to borrow our neighbor's car because ours was broken down. Should have had a DeSoto. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway... We came to the American River Bridge. and we got to the first approach, my mama says, Take it easy, Pop. <laughs> so we had the car stopped, and one baby was born. And I says, Well, go ahead now. We get to the hospital fast. So the driver got in. We started, and we got to the other end of the bridge. Mama says, Take it easy, Pop. <laughs> That's why they call them suspension bridges. I'll be sure bridges hereafter. <laughs> what about you, Mr. Story? Have you had an unusual experience? Well, uh, when Jerry was born... What number was he? Do you know? Well, he was number 12. Number 12. <laughs> I remember that very clearly. Robert I got out of the hospital and I went home. Well, there was uh, Levin down with a hooping cough and measles. Oh. So, uh, you never realized that night when you were on the bay and it was raining and you had the umbrella that uh, all this was going to happen. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, that'll teach you, Mr. Story. Never carry an umbrella when it's raining. <laughs> well, it's, it's really been inspiring having you two here tonight. And, Mr. Story... You have every right to be the proudest mother in the country. Now, you're going to play the DeSoto-Plymouth game? You bet your life. If you beat our other two couples, you get a crack at the $1,500 question. I can't tell you how much they won, but George is off stage to remind our listeners. The young engaged couple is still ahead with $40. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected nursery rhymes as your category. Is that right? And that's a subject you ought to know a great deal about. <laughs> you have $20, and how much are you going to try? Ten. Who called for his fiddlers three? Old King Cole. Old King Cole is right. <laughs> and they're on their way, Groucho, with $30. All right, you got $30. Remember, you're going for $1,500 tonight. How much of the 30 are you going to try? 25 25 Who was asleep under the haystack when he should have been tending sheep? Uh, Come on, now. Oh, I, I'm sorry. It's a shame, but it was Little Boy Blue. Very easy to get confused on that. They now have $5. Oh, you're all the way down to $5. All right, now. Here's your third question. You got $5, and how much are you going to bet? $5. Who picked a peck of pickled pepper? Peter Piper. Peter Piper is right. <laughs> on the way again, they have $10. All right, now you got $10. Here's your last chance to beat the other couple. How much of the 10 are you going to bet? All of it. All right, who fell down the hill and broke his crown? Jack. Jack is right. And they wind up with $20. And that means the young engaged couple gets the chance at the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question. You've got to see it to believe it. You've got to drive it to appreciate it. Yes, that's the new Plymouth. The great new Plymouth that's packed with value and ready to prove it. Prove this to yourself tomorrow at your DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Let your dealer arrange a demonstration drive. Then compare. Compare the value in this great new car with that in other leading low-priced cars. Compare the new beauty and style, the easy riding and wonderful handling, the great engineering that makes it the low-priced car most like high-priced cars. Check the prompt convenience of Plymouth's ignition key starting the flashing getaway power of the high-compression engine, 
the soft velvet stops of Safeguard hydraulic brakes, the protection of safety rim wheels, and many other exclusive Plymouth features. Yes, check and compare. For beauty, for power, for room, for riding comfort. Plymouth, now more than ever, the car that likes to be compared. See this great new Plymouth, the American beauty, at your DeSoto Plymouth dealers tomorrow. And while you're there, don't miss seeing the brilliant new DeSoto as well. A car that's truly new, with new features from bumper to bumper. The finest car that has ever borne the name DeSoto. Learn why your DeSoto Plymouth dealer is so proud of the two superb cars he has on display. The great new Plymouth and the brilliant new DeSoto. the young couple all ready for the DeSoto Plymouth $1,500 question, Groucho. All right, here we go for $1,500. Ready? I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on one single answer between you, so think carefully and please, no assistance from the audience. Here it is. Frederick Augustus Bartholdi was a famous French sculptor. His best-known work is well-known to all of us. What is Bartholdi's great work? Your liberty is right. That's right. You win one thousand five hundred dollars. You had the right answer. What are you going to do with all that money? I'm going to give it all to Marie. <laughs> what are you going to do with it, Marie? I'll take care of it. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations from the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. You Bet Your Life is a John Goodell production. Transcribed from Hollywood, directed by Bob Dwan and Bernie Smith. Music by Jerry Fielding. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this time for the Groucho Marx Show, You Bet Your Life. Presented by the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth. Two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And don't forget, next week's big question will be worth $1,000. Well, it's almost time for the Bing Crosby Show, and tonight I understand his guest star will be that incomparable comedian of You Bet Your Life. Hey, that's me, Groucho Marx. See you again in a few minutes, folks. And remember... Just be sure to see your DeSoto Plymouth dealer. Here's a tip from the National Safety Council. When you're in your car, be a wise driver, not a wise guy. This is George Fenneman signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mr. and Mrs. Victor Gook, young Mr. Rush Gook, and Sage's amiable Uncle Fletcher. Uncle Fletcher's been a supper guest. He's speaking at the moment, and we hear him say, There's no hurry about this, Sadie. We can talk about it at any time it's convenient for you. Right now, it's fine. Well, if you've got something private to discuss, Uncle Fletcher... Stone Rose here and myself are glad to retire to the kitchen and leave you guys alone. Sure. Not at all. Not at all. Stay where you are. I've got this little bit of stuff to tell Sadie, and then you people can play cards or pop popcorn or whatever's on the docket. I wouldn't mind a shot of popcorn after a while. Popcorn is delicious. Yeah. I remember the fellow once in Belvedere that ate popcorn with a bushel. Half wit to get up in the middle of the night and pop popcorn. One under the name of Morton. Albert Morton. Whatever become of him, I never did know. Some will tell you he went to St. Paul, Minnesota, and married a Cunningham. Others will tell you he went to Pawnee, Illinois, and married a Montgomery. Six of one, half a dozen of the other. Hmm. Uh, Albert Morton. He 
certainly like popcorn. What was it you wanted to talk to me about, Uncle Fletcher? Fine. No, you hear different stories about what become Albert Morton. Take K.L. Slater, Joe Frickley, and Harry Greel, Van Dixon. But all three of them swear up and down Albert Morton went to St. Paul, Minnesota, and married at Cunningham. T.V. Adams, Jim Wade, and Walter up to Graf claimed just the opposite. Albert Morton went to Pawnee, Illinois, and married about them, we will tell you. Hmm. I don't know. Hmm. Play a game of cards a bit? All right. Play a game of cards, Sadie? First? Sure. You said you had something to talk to me about. Albert Morton? No, when we were getting up from the supper table, you said... Oh, you... oh, sure, sure. Oh, hold up the card game on Mrs. Beck. Okay. My landlady, Mrs. Keller, Sadie. Yes? I might be buttoning this up with none of my business. If I am, say so. But I had this idea and didn't see whether there'd be any harm in mentioning it to you. Mm-hmm. If I'm out of order, speak up. Well, what about, Miss Keller? Could she join your symbol club? Why, I don't see why not. If I open my mouth and put my foot in it, say the word. Not at all. She's never said anything about the symbol club. It's my notion. I've been playing with that. Why, sure. I'll invite her the very next time we meet in my house here. Half-wit woman don't get it quite as easy, see? But a pal all this time and only knows about six people. Of course, she's got a married daughter she visits, and the ladies around the neighborhood come calling once in a while, but she's not in the swim of stuff like she was in Dixon. And it makes her peevish. Remember now, she's never mentioned any of this to me. Uh-huh. Well, I just thought... Here's my niece, Sadie, president of the symbol club where ladies sit and sew and talk. Does it cover and take to that like a duck takes to water? Uncle Fletcher, I think that's just awful sweet of you. Yes, yes it is. No, now, if I'm sticking my neck out, you just chop it off. Sweet as it can be. The very next time the symbol club meets here, I'll make it a special point to see that Mrs. Keller is expressly invited. Fine. Got an application blank handy, Rush? Application blank? I'll take it home and have Miss Keller throw it out. Oh, we don't have application blank. Five, name, age, weight, color, all that junk. As far as that goes, I can fill it out myself. Mrs. Keller's 56, weighs 165. Got an application blank in your pocket, Dick? <laughs> no, I haven't. I generally carry a few, but you've cut me short. Uh-huh. Nice of you to do this, lady. Golly, no. You're the nice one. Yes, yes, I am. I should have invited Miss Keller before. Oh, that's right. I don't know why I never thought of it. She sits, Miss Keller does. She sews. She talks. Thimble clubs just what she needs. Joy's being in the swim. No, the idea hit me just the other night. Here I've got this niece of mine, Sadie. Sadie's boss of this thimble outfit. Why not put a bug in Sadie's ear? Well, I'm glad you did. Uh-huh. You say you've got an application blank in your pocket, bit? I'm afraid I left all my application blanks in my other pen. Fine. Sadie, don't ever let on to her. I put this bug in your ear. Oh, I won't. Keeps give me a lie. Yeah. Oh, no, I won't go down. And I want to say again, I think you're just awful sweet to talk to me about this. Yes, yes, I am. No, she's lonesome. Membership in the Thimble Club is just what the doctor ordered. Cards, Vic? Got them all shuffled, ready to deal. Cards, Rush? Sure. Sadie? Well, you boys go ahead and play. I got this pile of socks to darn. Uncle Fletcher, Mr. Lumpass is telling me you and him. Oh, say, the application blank. <laughs> the application blank won't be necessary, Uncle Fletcher. Mrs. Keller weighs 165. She's 56 years old. Gray hair. There's nothing to fill out to join the symbol club. She'll be willing to fill it out. <laughs> oh, my. I'll fix him an application blank. You can draw one up in two minutes. No. Sure. Miss Keller is no better than anybody else. Just because you're my niece is no reason for showing her any special favors. Where's that application blank? I'll fill out the son of a gun. Step to the bookcase and frame one, Oscar. <laughs> okay. The application blank to come visit the thimble club. You insist on it, Judy. Sure. No, my landlady can go through what everybody else has to go through. She's neither sugar nor salt. Don't hurt her this 
final application, Black. I'll deal with it. Okay. Eighteen apiece, huh? Or oh, seven apiece. Are you in, Kettle Drum? Well, leave me out this hand. I'm fixing up an application, Black. Just this two, I guess. Why? Somebody suggest popping some popcorn after a while? Well, you did. Uh-huh. Popcorn hits the spot long about the middle of the evening. I got the habit off an Albert Morton and Bell over there. We bunked together all one winter. He ate popcorn with a bushel. Get up at night and pop yourself a batch of popcorn. Oh, that's uh, enough ticket. Why? Wonder what did become Albert Morton. Some people tell you one thing. Some people tell you the other thing. J.G. Hess up on his farm there outside of Sterling used to claim Albert Morton went to Finley, Ohio and married a Williams. That I know is Mm. He may have gone to St. Paul, Minnesota, and married a Cunningham like K.L. Sleater, Joe Frickley, and Harry Greel claim. Mm. He may have gone to Pony, Illinois, and married a Montgomery like T.V. Adams, Jim Wade, and Walter Epigraph claim. Mm. But one thing I'm sure of, he never went to Finley, Ohio, and married a Williamson like J.G. Hess claim. Never. Duffy Seven, where do you leave me? See, Archie, the manager's thinking Duffy ain't here. Oh, hello, Duffy. Tonight, Sonny Tuff. You remember the guy, Duffy. The one that when you once said to your wife, tell me what has he got that I ain't got, she talked for two days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, big tall guy, Duffy. You know, broad shoulders, big chest, slim waist, big blue eyes. Wavy blonde hair. Boy, if he was only a thing. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> well, well, I'll call you back, Duffy. The band just started to play that new western song I wrote, Leave Me Heart Ride Tonight on the Prairie. And I want to listen to it. I guess it's just modesty, Duffy, but I really love that song. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Duffy's Tavern. Come in and meet Finnegan, Eddie the waiter, Miss Duffy, our singer Bob Graham, Reed Beat Reeves and his orchestra, our special guest tonight, Sonny Tuff, and Archie himself, Ed Gardner. Lover, no doubt. <laughs> Tell them crumbs if they don't like my song, they can lump it. The back of my throat to them. <laughs> I'm a saying bonus notes to the city. It's no place for a lonesome cow's hand. Leave me right. Wait a minute. Now listen, you guys, be careful how you throw them dishes around. Remember, China is... Our ally. <laughs> well, Eddie, I, I guess all great composers have to suffer like this. That's right, Miss Archer. And these people are just trying to help you. <laughs> well, I guess it's a lot in life, Betty. Look at Tichikowski. <laughs> all they paid him was 1812 for a whole overture. <laughs> and look at Schubert and his symphony. He wouldn't even let him finish it. <laughs> so I say, leave him mock me. After this song of mine gets published, the world will be singing a different tune. Mm. Now that I believe. <laughs> yeah. so anyway, who, who's going to publish that song? My publishers, the Million Dollar Publishing Company. Who's that? They're the people that discovered me. How did they discover you? I answered their ad in the magazine. <laughs> here, look at it. Let's see, you know. It says here. Attention songwriters, have you got a lot of talent and a little money? We will bring it out of you. 
If your song is a hit, we'll know it. Remember, Jada, Always, Swanee, Margie, all big hits and we knew it. <laughs> so, so don't delay. Send your song to the Million Dollar Publishing Company and make a million tomorrow. Please enclose 15 cents to cover costs. <laughs> So sound like a very reliable firm, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You sent them your song, of course. Oh, naturally. I wouldn't want to fess up an awful like that. What do you think I am, a sucker? There will be a three-minute pause while I wrestle with temptation. <laughs> well, good luck, sir. Uh, thanks, Eddie. Boy, I hope I happen them soon. Oh, <laughs> Hiya, Finnegan. Today I got no song of yours. Great song. Thanks. It's running through my head. Well, what's going to stop it? <laughs> Nothing. Boy, what a beautiful song. To let my heart right to my temporary. So the words got so much meaning. Thanks, Finnegan. So yours. Yeah. What's it, Granny? Larry, it's uh, a thing out west, uh, sort of a flat hill. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, you know, Ark, every day you learn me something new. I always tell everybody that uh, you make me what I am today. I mean, if you don't mind, I would rather not be connected with it. <laughs> Well, take the credit, Art. You'll enjoy it. Good evening, Archie. Well, Officer Clancy, glad to see you. Come in and take a load off your beat. <laughs> uh, hello, Clancy. Well, it's Clifton Finnegan. Been behaving yourself, Clifton? Sorry, oh, yeah, Clancy. Are you sure? Look, if it's about writing Clancy's a stinker on that fence, I got an alibi. <laughs> What's your alibi? Uh, I can't write. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Finnegan, I get a kick out of you. Bless your little brain. <laughs> you know, I was with your father the night you came into this world. You was? Yes, sir. And five years later, he called me up and he said, Clancy, it's a boy. <laughs> a shot in the dark if I ever heard one. <laughs> Say, uh, by the way, uh... What do you have, Clancy? Oh, the usual shot through split. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, Archie, they tell me you've written a song. A song? Yeah, that's right, Clancy. An Irish song, I hope. Well, uh, uh... What do you call it? Uh, leave my heart ride tonight on the prairie. Oh, it's a beautiful title. Leave me heart ride tonight on the prairie. <laughs> uh, no, Clancy, a prairie. Wait a minute. Not a western song. Yeah. Shades of Chauncey Alcott. Don't you know that the only good songs is Irish songs? Now, just a second. Don't Clancy. take my word for it. Ask any Irishman. <laughs> the I ain't saying there's nothing wrong with Irish songs. Mine just happens to be a western. Well, then the least you can do is to give it a little Irish flavor. All right. I'll call it Take Me Back to My Boots and My Kushla. <laughs> I'll write another one called The Flight Boy of the Irish World. That'll make you happy.
Who, Miss Duff? Who? Sonny Tuck. Well, who else would I spend a whole day in a beauty shop? A whole day in a beauty shop? What's the matter? Were they out of it? <laughs> Very funny. Now, please, I've got no patience to stand here being stupid. Where's Sonny Tuck? What do you want with Sonny Tuck? I'm going to ask him to the dance. What dance? The Ten Jolly Girls AC St. Valentine's Day track meeting dance. <laughs> track me. Well, uh, you know some of the girls when they see a man. Yes, I do. <laughs> so uh, we thought it would look more dignified if we called it a track meet. I see. But Sonny Tuff, uh, look, why don't you ask your boyfriend, uh, Breckenbridge Hartsenfelder, to take you to the dance? Oh, uh, him and me had a fight, so I'm not going with him. Oh, what was the fight about? He wouldn't take me to the dance. <laughs> but who cares? Oh, if I could walk into that dance with Sonny Tuck, would those girls drop dead? Sonny Tuck, take you to the dance, Miss Duffy. You're flying around the helium scopper. <laughs> he wouldn't take you. Oh, no? Just because he's a movie star? Listen, Archie, many a big movie star goes out with civilian girls. <laughs> What a sensation we've created the dance. Oh, I can see it now. Mr. Sonny Tuck, this is Mr. Trinker Yarbut. Mr. Tuck, this is Cheryl Rotino. Sonny Tuck, please can be yet a nickel blocker. I noticed poor Tuck is so shocked he ain't saying a word. <laughs> Henrietta Mickle, Doctor. Say, Miss Archie, special delivery letter for you. Oh, boy, let's see, Eddie. Yep, from that publishing firm. Let's see. Dear friend and honored artist, we have received your great song and believe it will join the ranks of the immortals. That means it won't die. Eight to five. Quiet, Eddie. <clears throat> uh, can't wait till we publish this great song of the West. Naturally, it should have an attractive, appropriate cover. <clears throat> So, please send $25, which covers course of printing, plus hiring of cowboy, horse, and sunset. Please rush money. <clears throat> Yours in haste, Million Dollar Publishing Company. <clears throat> Where am I going to get 25 bucks? You ain't actually going to send it. I got it, Eddie. The letter says rush. Yeah, but this is a phony. Now, wait a minute, Eddie. I can recognize phonies. Just talking to a man who can get plenty. <laughs> Let's see, where can I get that 25? Don't look at me. Hmm. Hey, there's a cash register. <laughs> there's money in there. <laughs> do tell. <laughs> now, look, you ain't going to do nothing jelly. Look, Daddy, what would be wrong if I just took a loan of the dough? That would be like Jesse James taking the loan of a train. <laughs> but who's going to know about it? <laughs> Mm, twenty, twenty-five. If I had the wings of an angel. <laughs> now listen, Eddie, this ain't stealing. This is just free distribution. <laughs> now, uh, now take this dough, go down to the post office, and send a money order to the address on this letter. Okay, Miss Austin. And make it pronto. Adios. Sam Clinton. <laughs> Go on, get going. Oh, boy, it won't be long now. I should say you won't, Mr. Dirty Crook Archie. Miss Duffy, was you standing there all the time? I certainly was. And you know what'll happen if I tell Papa. He'll put you in jail. Miss Duffy, please don't tell your father. Just give me a little time. Mr. Well, uh, Archie, I might forget if, uh... If what? If a certain party could persuade a certain party to take a certain party to a certain party. You mean if I don't get Sonny Tuck? Miss Duffy, that's blackboard. <laughs> you can't do this. Take your choice, Archie. Hmm. Say, Archie. Oh, hello, Tom. What seems to be wrong here? Well, uh, nothing that a few years. Please, Miss Duffy, leave us not discuss my delinquency in front of the juvenile. Leave us talk it over in private. Uh, Bob, sing something, will you? Well, you sure seem worried. Oh, no, it's nothing. It's just a little trouble with my song. Seems there's a few bars connected with it that I forgot about. <laughs> uh, 
Go ahead and sing. Now, come here, Miss Duffy. Let's talk this over. Sometimes I wonder why I spend the lonely night dreaming of a song. The melody haunts my reverie, and I am once again with you. When our love was new, and each kiss an inspiration. Oh, but that was long ago. Now my consolation is in the stardust of a song. Beside the garden wall, when stars are bright, you are in my arms. The nightingale tells this fairy tale of paradise where roses bloom. Though I dream in vain. In my heart, it will remain my stardust melody. Memory of love refrain. Uh, now, look, Miss Duffy, be reasonable. I can't make Sonny Tuff take you to the dance. I know is that if you don't, I'll have Papa put you in jail for 20 years, and when you get out, he'll fire you. <laughs> well, look, the guy's a society guy in a movie, so... Oh, Archie, here he comes. Uh, oh, uh, Sonny Tuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, welcome to Duffy's, Sonny. Thanks. Say, I always kind of thought that Duffy's was just a little hole in the wall. Yeah, kind of surprised you, huh? Yeah, it's a big hole in the wall. <laughs> Say, uh, who are you? Me? Uh, oh, permit me. Uh, I am uh, Archie, mine host. Uh, <laughs> I manage the place, take care of the customers. Uh, oh, uh, sort of a major domo. Exactly. We don't save miners. <laughs> Say, what a big guy you are. How's the air up there? <laughs> <laughs> See, that's, that's very clever. I pick them up all the time. But uh, <clears throat> I'm really serious. That's uh, quite a tall height you got there. Uh, come here, let's put our heads back to back. See, you're, you're about three inches taller than I am. Well, that's just because you're three inches shorter. <laughs> hey, you're clever, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like in a lot of ways, Sonny. Oh, well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> no, I mean it, really. Well, like two peas on a night. You... <laughs> you got a strap and physique? I got a strap and physique. Uh, what would you do if the strap broke? <laughs> now, Sonny, please, don't judge me physique by the way that I'm built. <laughs> Deceitful. How much do you weigh? A hundred and ten pounds? <laughs> and not an ounce of it fat. Hmm. Hmm. All bone, eh? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> just take a look at his chest. Where? Oh, there, behind the belt buckle. <laughs> there he drove. Uh, Mr. Tuft, uh, uh, in these uh, quips of yours, do I detect a slight tincture of jealousy? <laughs> no, it's not that. It's just, uh... That to me, you seem more like a frail type. Frail type is right. The frails love me. <laughs> yeah. You know that uh, Betty Hutton you work with? She's coming all the way down here to see me next Friday. Really? Gotta get some rest. <laughs> Don't be silly. A dame like that'll be meat for me. Well, that'll make it even. You'll be mutton for Hutton. <laughs> Oh, boy, Betty Hutton. Boy, I can't wait for next week to get here. Come on, Sonny, let's talk faster. 
Mr. Hayat, Miss Duffy just sent this note over to you. Let's see. Dear Rocky. Well, sign Miss Duffy. <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, Finnegan, uh, do you know Sonny Tufts? He does? <laughs> Finnegan, this is Sonny Tuck, the movie actor. Oh, t- how do you do, Mr. Tuck? Hey, t- you look much taller standing up than you do on the screen. Well, you see, uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, they photographed me shorter so my head won't hit the soundtrack. <laughs> oh, that's uh, how, do they, how do they make you shorter? They put me on a diet, shortening bread. <laughs> It's a coincidence. Uh, Finnegan eats cracked wheat. <laughs> uh, you know, Mr. Tufts, uh, I like to try acting sometimes. Uh, when I was at college, they told me... Finnegan, you was at college. <laughs> well, certainly I was at college, Art. you remember last year? Huh? What did you study at college? I didn't study anything. They studied me. (laughs) But uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Tufts, Mr. Tufts, I I, I really think that you're very... Well, just call me Sonny. Eh? What was that? Just call me Sonny. Gee, that's very nice of you, Sonny. You can call me Daddy. (laughs) What a charming family. Lovely people. (laughs) Oh, <clears throat> oh, say, incidentally, Sonny, uh, speaking of beautiful dames, uh, get a load of that beaut over there. Where? Right over there, next to the cash register. Oh, yeah. She's the one without the keys. <laughs> yeah. A wonderful dame. Would you like to meet her? Not at all. Good. I'll <laughs> <bring you. laughs> I do it the hard way. <laughs> you see, uh, I just happened to remember that Sonny was once a society guy, you know, strictly a big Boston socialist. So, <laughs> so, uh, Ergo, you got to act like a society dame. Well, all right, but if it don't work... If it don't work, if it don't work, all the time, talk, talk. Talk, talk is better than sing, sing. <laughs> Oh, here goes. Uh, hey, Sonny. Yeah? Uh, Sonny, old cat, I would, uh, 
I would like to present you with Miss Duff Duffy. Uh, she just came out this year. Hmm, brave girl. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Miss Duff Duffy, you don't happen to be related to the Duff Duffy owns this tab tavern, do you? Oh, yes. Papa is my paper. <laughs> But you uh, see, the tavern is just one of his hobbies. Uh, <laughs> he keeps it for love. What a morbid sense of humor. Look, I know what you're thinking, Sonny, but this name has ancestors from some of our best families. Uh, but I'm telling you, you can see for yourself that she's real society. Of course. She has such a prominent background. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> that she gets from her old lady. Uh, by the by, darling, uh, uh, how is your mentor these days? How is it than ever, I suppose? Oh, you know, Mater, here, there, everywhere in the social world, she's all over New York. Yeah, and part of her hangs over into New Jersey. <laughs> oh, she stop insulting Mama and get to the point. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, say, incidentally, Sonny, uh, Miss Duff Duffy's sorority is giving a dance <laughs> You may not believe it, but she hasn't had a date for it yet. I believe it. <laughs> hmm. Say, uh, why couldn't Sonny here take you to the dance? Well, yes, uh, mm. Why not? Yeah. How about it, Sonny? When is it? St. Valentine's. Why, George, I can't make it. <laughs> <laughs> why not? On account of a previous engagement, which I'm sure I can arrange. <laughs> Wait a minute, Sonny. You've got to take the thing. There's a thing I can't tell you about, but if you don't take her, it means that I go to jail. Why don't you take herself, then? Take her yourself, then. She wants you. Ah, you take her. Just like you said, you know, you look so much alike, you'll never know the difference, kid. Hoisted <laughs> by my own facade. Somebody's going to take me to the dance. I see what you mean. <laughs> okay, Miss Duffy, I guess you got me with me. Miss Archer. What? Reprieve from the governor. <laughs> you mean you didn't send the dough? No. On account of picture I saw hanging in the post office. Whose picture? The president of the million dollar publishing company marked down to a thousand dollars reward. <laughs> The guy was a crook? Yep. And here's your 25. Oh, boy, I'm a free man again. Now I can put the dough back into the register. Just a second, Archie. You don't have to put it back in the register if you take me to the dance. Mm. <laughs> Duffy's Tavern. Hello, Duffy. Yeah, that's right. Next week, Betty Hutton. Uh, and you know, uh, Duffy, tonight, Sonny Tuff said that I'd be mutton for Hutton, but uh, who cares? I'm a glutton for mutton. <laughs> See you next Friday, Duffy. Forces Radio Service.
Prell, P-R-E-L-L, Procter & Gamble's new Radiant Cream Shampoo in the handy tube. Prell brings you the life of Riley. <laughs> The shampoo that removes dandruff in as little as three minutes and leaves hair radiantly clean, radiantly lovely, presents The Life of Riley with William Bendix as Riley. <laughs> Chester A. Riley loves his fellow men, except when they happen to love his daughter Babs. He regards all of Babs' ardent boyfriends with disfavor, except young Simon Vanderhopper, whom he actually despises. For further details, let's go back to the other evening. Riley's just come home. Gosh, I'm hungry, Dumplin. How's about supper? Well, soon, dear. We have to wait for Simon Vanderhopper. Simon Vanderhopper? Why do we have to wait well, for... Well, Simon's having dinner with us, Daddy. He's taking me out tonight. I forbid it. I won't have that Simon taking my daughter to them cheap dance halls. I've seen what goes on in them dance halls. Wrestling to music. What's <laughs> Riley? And the dancing ain't the worst of it. After the dance, those kids hop into their parents' cars and drive around like crazy, 60 miles an hour. First thing you notice, a smash up and the car is wrecked. And if you think I'm going to let Babs wreck our brand new car... Riley, we haven't got a car. That's right. Throw it up to me. <laughs> Besides, we're not going to a dance. Simon's taking me to a meeting of the Da Vinci Art Club. I don't care. I don't want you going around with that sofa loafer. <laughs> He's not a loafer. And he'll be famous someday. Simon's got great artistic talent. Yeah, some artists. You know those billboards on the corner with the cute little babies on them? I caught Simon drawing mustaches on them. Oh, I don't believe it. Now, go down to the corner and see for yourself. All those poor babies look like Dewey. <laughs> Relax, will you, Riley? Say, Mom, what do we eat? I'm starved. Oh, that must be Simon. Well, that pest is here. Serve the soup. Well, give him a chance to get in the house and be sweet to him for once. Okay, right after dinner, I'll sit on his lap. <laughs> Good evening, all. Hello, Simon. How are you, Simon? Babs, don't move. Ah, oh, beautiful. The way the light picks out the auburn glint in your raven-colored hair. And your eyes, two limpid pools of lovely blue. Just stand there and let me drink it all in. <laughs> First he eats my food, now he's drinking my daughter. Oh, well, dinner's ready. Sit down, everybody. I hope I didn't hold dinner up. I had to stop off at the art shop and buy some clay. I'm going in for sculpting now, you know. You know, Simon, I, I wish I knew more about art. Pass the salt, Junior. It's our greatest form of culture, Mrs. Riley. Pass the pepper, Babs. Now, you take Gainsborough's Blue Boy. What do you think of it? Well, Pass I... the vinegar. <laughs> think of what, dude? Blue Boy, Mr. Riley. Blue... Oh, Blue Boy. Your great horse on a fast track, but he's Blue Boy. <laughs> oh, Daddy, you wake up. <laughs> well, what's the big joke? You think I said something stupid or something? Um... Ah, Blue Boy's a famous painting, not a horse. Well, he's a horse in my circle. Pass something, somebody. Cheer up, Mr. Riley. We can't all be art connoisseurs. Well, say, Mother, maybe Simon could pick out that thing you want for the piano. Well, well maybe... What thing is that? Well, well I, I've always wanted a sort of small statue for the top of the piano. Oh, that. Well, I told you I'd get it for you, Peg. Say, I saw just the thing the other day. A little bust of Tchaikovsky. It's on sale at Ye Little Knick-Knack. No. Tchaikovsky. <laughs> Why, that'd be just right. Could you buy it for me, Simon? I'll buy it for you, Peg. I respect your judgment, Simon. Delighted, Mrs. Riley. I'm just the man to handle the matter. Now, wait a minute. Why can't I manhandle the matter? <laughs> Ain't I your husband? Oh, now, dear. What do you know about art? A blue boy on a fast track. <laughs> I don't have to stand for this. My own family laughing at my ignorance. As the head of this house, you've got to respect my ignorance. <laughs> don't worry, Mr. Riley. We won't tell anyone about Blue Boy. We'll keep it a secret among the five of us. 
You mean the four of us, Simon. But there are five of us here. Yes, now, but you're talking in the present tense. I'm talking in the predicate. <laughs> Simon, get out of this house. Let's go home, Pop. We must have been to every art store in town. Junior, I ain't going home until I buy something artistic for the piano. I'll show your mother I'm just as smart as that idiot Simon. <laughs> oh, now, what do you care about that Simon? You're missing the whole point, son. You heard your mother at supper last night, the way she laughed at me like I was a hyena. And so what? I gotta make her respect me. Oh, now, come on home. No, my head's made up. <laughs> Hey, there's a place that's got sculptures on us, Harry's. Come on, let's, let's take a look in the window. Gosh, look at all that junk. Yeah. Now, there's what I call a stupid statue. Look, that naked truck driver delivering a basketball. <laughs> uh, Pop. Pop, that's Atlas holding up the world. <laughs> What a show-off. Let's go. I don't think we're funny. Wait a minute. Look in the corner there, way in the back. That statue. That's it. That's it, Junior! Oh, no, Pop. Not that. You don't like it. Why, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Gorgeous. Well, I don't think Mom would like it. Well, well maybe you better wait till you find a bust of Tchaikovsky. No, no. This is a thousand times better. I'm buying it. And believe me, when your mother lays her eyes on that, she'll go out of her mind. Oh, this thing weighs a ton. Here we are, Pop. Now watch the steps. Yeah, I'll take it. Open the door, Judy. That's it. I'll get it in. Peg! Peg, I'm home! Daddy, what's in that big package? Riley, what in the world have you got there? Well, Junior, it... let me tell him. It's a present for you, Dumplin. For me? What is it? Now you'll see that Simon ain't the only one knows something about art. Riley, you bought a bus to Tchaikovsky. I told Pop that's what you wanted, I but got yet... you something even better, bigger and better. Here, let me put it on top of the piano. It's a little heavy, but... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, unwrap it, Daddy. Don't keep us in suspense. Okay, get ready for a big thrill. There she is. Venus de Milo in the flesh. <gasps> Daddy! Big, ain't she? <laughs> she must be three feet if she's an inch. Reaches almost to the ceiling. Yes, it, it's quite a sight. Oh, you don't know the half of it. You see that wreath of flowers around her head? Well, they light up. Light up? Yeah. Red and green. Red and green? What for? For the beauty of it. And that's nothing. Her eyes light up, too. Oh, no. Well, sure. That tells you what station you got. <laughs> station? Yeah, that's the big surprise. Venus has a built-in radio in her stomach. <laughs> Radio. You just turn her eyeballs in their sockets and the program comes out of her mouth. <laughs> well, what do you think of her, eh? Well, well... I knew it would leave you speechless. <laughs> yes, I'm actually stunned. Great. But you'll like it even better when she's all lit up and her radio's playing. Oh, wait, I'll go get a light plug in the kitchen. Oh, Mother, isn't that the most horrible thing you ever laid eyes on? Shh, your father will hear you. Yes. But we can't keep this monstrosity in the house. Tomorrow night, my art club's meeting here, and I'll die if they see it. Well, how do you think I'll feel when those cats in my sewing club see it? Oh, oh Junior, why'd you let him buy it? Well, I tried to stop him. Almost did, too, but then that salesman got hold of him and started to flatter pop and, and tell him he was smart and... Well, you know, Mom, like you do when you want to get money out of them. <laughs> oh, it's so ugly. Who'd ever think of making a thing like that? Well, the salesman told Pop it was built special for a millionaire Indian chief who struck oil. The red man's revenge. <laughs> Daddy, 
he'll have to get rid of it. He'll just have to. Oh, but, Bab, I can't hurt his feelings like that. After all, he bought it for me. He meant well. But, Mother, those red and green lights, the living room will look like a traffic intersection. I know, but I, I just can't tell him it's... Oh, shh. Now, don't let on. We'll, we'll think of something later. All right, I got the plug. Now, just wait till you see her all lit up. I tell you, she's gorgeous. There. Now, I just push this button. Ha. Ah. Well, ain't that something? Look how her hair lights up. And look at her eyes lighting up. But, Daddy, now the tip of her nose is glowing. Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you. That's where I light my cigars. <laughs> in there, Simon, in the living room. Honestly, it's the most gruesome thing you've ever seen. Oh, it can't be that bad. After all, it is Venus de Milo, and... Oh! I'm not a drinking man. How can I be having the DTs? I told you it was horrible. Oh, you got to get rid of this thing, Babs. What if the art club should see it? I know. I pleaded with Mother, but she says we'll have to put up with it, at least for a while. Honestly, I almost wish someone would rob us tonight and take it. Robbery. That's it. That would solve everything. Oh, be practical. Besides, what self-respecting burglar would steal that statue? Anyway, I don't know any crooks. What about me? I mean, I could get rid of the thing and make it look like a real robbery. Oh, you're goofy. Besides, Mother would never permit it. We won't tell her. And if Daddy ever caught you... I'll take that chance. For you, I'd become a thief. A murderer. I love you, Babs. I love you madly. Morning, Dumplin'. Morning, Babsy. Uh, morning, Daddy. Good morning, dear. You ready for your breakfast? Yeah, in a minute. First, I'll go turn on Venus so we can get the news straight out of her mouth. Oh, well, wait, Daddy. Well, 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 what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Go on. Yeah, I'll be right back. I love you. I love you. I die, 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 die. Come here, quick. Well, what happened, Riley? Is something wrong, Daddy? We've been robbed. She's gone. Venus is gone. Oh, that's awful. I mean, that's awful. Why, where could it have gone, Riley? Well, she didn't go herself. Somebody took her. She's kidnapped. Oh, good heavens. Is anything else missing? Ain't the statue enough? I'd like to lay my hands on the one who stole it. Some crooks have got no respect for other people's property. Riley, who are you phoning? The police, that's who. Oh, that's Simon. We're going bike riding. Uh, come in. I ain't got enough trouble. He has to show up. Good morning, everybody. Swell day, isn't it? Oh, uh, something wrong? Plenty's wrong. We've been robbed. Venus is stolen. No. Uh, you don't know who did it, do you? No, oh, but when I get hold of them... Oh, hello, hello. Police headquarters, Sergeant Clinton speaking. Oh, police, listen, she's gone, she's missing. Oh, take it easy, mister, who's missing? Venus, I woke up this morning... Missing, huh? Yeah. Can you give us a description? Yeah, yeah, she's about three feet tall. Three feet? Uh, how much does she weigh? Around 200 pounds. <laughs> 200? Yeah, and she's beautiful. Three feet tall, 200 pounds. Sounds gorgeous. Uh, where was she the last time you saw her? In the living room, last night. She was all lit up. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This kid was drunk? No, no, no. She's got red and green lights in her head. No arms, a radio in her stomach, and you can light a cigar on the tip of her nose. No, listen, you got to find my statue for me. Oh, it's a statue. Yeah. Uh, that's a relief. Now, what's your name and address? Chester Riley, 1313 Blueview Terrace. All right, Riley. When we find it, we'll call you back. Oh, thanks. Thanks, officer. Cheer up, Dumplin'. They'll catch the burglar. I hope so. And when they do, all I want is for the cops to leave me alone with them. I'll turn them inside out and tear them limb from limb. The gosh, Mr. Riley, you don't really mean that. I don't, eh? Well, I'll prove it to you whether I mean it, Simon. When I'm giving this low-down sneak and crook the beating of his life, you're going to be there. Well, well, 
hear the second act of the life of Riley in a moment. Thousands cheer for Prell. The new star of shampoos is Prell. Procter & Gamble's radiant cream shampoo in the handy tube. Everybody's cheering for Prell because Prell leaves hair more radiant for two reasons. First, Prell removes unglamorous, unsightly dandruff in as little as three minutes. Examinations by a group of doctors proved it. Second, Prell leaves hair more radiant than any soap or soap shampoo. Prell can't leave a dulling soap film. Prell leaves hair radiantly clean, radiantly soft, radiantly smooth and beautiful. Easy to manage, too. And the whole family cheers that handy-to-use Prell tube. No messy jars, no slippery bottles. And a little Prell makes mountains of lather. You'll sing the phrases of... P-R-E-L-L, Prell Shampoo, leaves hair radiant, gleaming bright. Not a bit of dandruff is inside. Comes in a tube, handy, too. P-R-E-L-L, Prell Shampoo. And now back to the life of Riley with William Bendix as Riley. Oh. Hey. Yeah. Pets, pets, come here quick. Look, I got Venus back. Why, Riley, where did hey, you, you find... that thing again, Pa? Yes, sir. Well, Daddy, did they catch the thief? No, I was walking by Sam's secondhand shop. I looked in the window and there she was. <laughs> Boy, was she glad to see me. <laughs> Ain't we lucky peg finding Venus like that? Luck isn't the word. <laughs> But where did the dealer find it, Daddy? In the last place you'd think of finding her. The city dump. <laughs> hey, that reminds me. Well, Riley, what are you doing? i got to tell the police. And call this Sergeant Clinton talking. Hello, Sergeant. Remember I phoned you this morning about a statue? And yeah, who is this? Well, you know, Riley, the guy who needs a psychiatrist. Huh? I mean... Uh... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What now? Well, you don't have to look anymore. I found Venus. Oh, well, I'm glad you two are together again. Let me know when the wedding is. <laughs> Come on, Riley. We'll be late for the lunch. I'll see your scope at your later. But this will only take a minute, Gillis. you got to see Venus. It's beautiful. What's there to get so excited about a statue? On account of that statue, I got back my family's respect. You see, my wife thought all I was... All right, a... all right. I heard the story a million times already. Well, let's go in the back way, sure. Oh, when you see Venus, you fall in love with her, too. But, Mother, just look at that statue. Oh, they can't stop raving about her. Well, I know it's repulsive, but they'll just have to live with it. Repulsive? Oh, uh, no, they can't be talking about the statue. Cheer up, Riley. Maybe they're talking about you. <laughs> oh, I hope so. But how, how could Daddy have such dreadful taste? Well, after all, he's a man. Oh, now, look, Babs, we just can't let him know how we feel, so let's not talk about it anymore. Come on, dear, we'll be late for the movie. Oh, all right, but Simon was right. He said it belongs in the city dump. Well, let's go. Gillis, I must be dreaming. Let me pinch you. <laughs> Come on, let's go to the line. Gillis, they don't respect me after all. So what if your family don't respect you? Why should you be different from any other married man? <laughs> Come on. Oh, somebody at the back. I don't want to see anybody. Hello, Mr. Riley. Hi there, Mr. Gillis. Simon. You're just the one I want to see. Always glad to see a fellow art expert. <laughs> Why, you, you weasel, if it hadn't have been for you, they'd have liked that statue. You poisoned their minds against me. Hey, take it easy. Let me at him. I'll slaughter him. Help, help. Riley, stop your thorn for joy. I do. <laughs> uh, Simon, listen to me carefully. Yes, sir. Look at my face. Your face? Open your eyes. Take a good look at it. I'm looking at it. Riley, stop torturing the boy. <laughs> now listen, Simon. Forget you ever saw this face. You never saw me before in your life. But, but, but Mr. Riley... From now on, we're through. I don't exist no more for you. No matter where you see me, don't you dare recognize me. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't even look at me. Yes, sir. It'll be a pleasure. I mean... Simon, get out of this house! <laughs> What's 
the use. Fella goes along trying his best all his life, and in the end, what happens? Why not let me worry about that? Who's that? It is I, Digby O'Dell, the friendly undertaker. <laughs> oh, hello, Digger. I didn't hear you come in the house. Greetings, Riley. You're looking fine. Very natural. I feel terrible. Digger, do you know anything about art, sculpture? Oh, I prefer painting. Recently, I was elected president of the UEPSLS. UEPSLS? The Undertakers, Embalmers, and Pallbearers, Still Life Society. <laughs> oh, I'm always painting. You must come over to my place and lie down for a portrait. <laughs> Now, you mean sit for a portrait. You paint your way, I'll paint my way. <laughs> but, Riley, you seem unduly disturbed. Yeah, it's that statue there. What statue? On the piano behind you. Well, what about... Do? <laughs> Pretty bad, huh? Horrible. So, pagan beds were right. They hate it. They're so right. All right, so it don't look so good, but it's practical, see? Venus has a radio in her tummy. He dead, man. You're not serious. So remember, folks, hurry and buy a box of Vital Pepto. Vital Pepto is guaranteed to add ten years to your life. Shut that thing off. <laughs> Oh, I don't know what to do, Digger. I guess buying that statue was a mistake. It's not too late. In our profession, we have a motto. When you make a mistake, cover it up. <laughs> Get rid of this, right? Well, I could, but I can't admit I was wrong. I want to save my face. Why? <laughs> Be practical, Riley. Dispose of this ghastly exhibit and... Uh, tell them the house was robbed. Say, that's an idea. It happened once before. I'll stage a fake robbery. I'll leave the statue at your place. Sorry. If I had a thing like that in my place, my customers would get up and walk out. <laughs> well, I'll get rid of it somewhere. Gee, this statue is heavy. No, don't lift it like that. Uh -huh. Put your left hand there. Uh -huh. And your right hand so. There. Uh -huh. Now lift it. Well, yes. Yeah. Hey, it's light as a feather. What's the secret, Digger? You've heard of the fireman's carry? Uh, this is the undertaker's clutch. <laughs> well, cheerio. I'd better be shoveling off. that movie, Babs. So did I. I adore Cary Grant. Oh, he's nice. He's... Babs, the statue, it's gone. Oh, that's wonderful. But how... And look, the window's broken. Babs, we've been robbed again. Oh, no. Who'd steal a thing like that? Well, it's funny, all right. Well, nothing else seems to be missing. I better call the police. Oh, Mother, no. They might find it. Well, we can't have burglars wandering in and out of this house. Operator, give me police headquarters. Statue's getting heavier every second. I should have taken a taxi. I... What's that? Cops. Just a minute, mister. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah, officer. What are you carrying there under that sheet? Uh, uh, oh, oh, this? Well, that's nothing. It's just my wife. Your wife, huh? Yeah, she, she's a little stiff tonight. I mean, I ain't done anything, officer. Your wife, huh? We better take a little ride down to the station. No, no, wait, officer. I can explain. You see, I, I took this statue, so, uh, but I, I robbed it, so, uh, but I didn't really rob it. I just stole it, so. You're hanging in with the man. <laughs> Sergeant, I tell you, I'm innocent. You got the wrong man. I'm Riley. You're looking for another crook. You keep saying you're Riley, but we require some positive identification. Well, I... Wait a minute. I, I, I'll roll up my sleeve. There, look at my elbow. You see that wart? 
It's a birthmark. I've had it since I was 20 years old. <laughs> well, that's hardly true. What? Do you deny this is my elbow? Look, you were picked up with the stolen goods belonging to a Mrs. Riley. You claim to her husband, oh, but Sergeant you have... Clinton. Yes? I just talked to the Riley house again. Someone's on the way here to identify the stolen goods. Good, good. If this guy's Riley, they can identify him. Do you deny this is my wart? <laughs> After I'm identified, I'll make trouble for you. I'll have you court-martialed. Sit out. Uh, yes, sir. Excuse me, I'm Simon Vanderhopper. Mrs. Riley sent me down to identify... Simon, her. you darling, oh, I'm glad you're here. Tell this policeman who I am. Just a minute. A young man, can you identify this statue? Yes, sir. That was stolen from the Riley house. Good. Now, how about this man? He claims he's Chester Riley, is he? Well, well go, go ahead, Simon. Tell him who I am. <laughs> I never saw his face before in my life. <laughs> what? Simon, what are you saying? How could you forget this face? Simon, tell him. I don't recognize you, sir. Simon, you... As far as I'm concerned, he doesn't exist. Well, I guess I'll be going. Simon, no, you, you, you can't do this. You can't leave me rot in jail. I want to rot at home. <laughs> I'll do anything, Simon. Anything you say, only tell him who I am. Hey, what is all this? Is this guy Riley or isn't he? Well, to tell the truth, Sergeant, I never knew Mr. Riley too well. Maybe if he let me visit his daughter more often, I would have gotten to know him better. Simon, and, uh... I promise. From now on, you can see Babs every week. It's a funny thing, Sergeant. He does seem to be a little familiar. Twice a week, Simon. His name is right on the tip of my tongue. Every night in the week, Simon. I got it. Who am I? Chester Riley, my future father-in-law. <laughs> Hiya, Dad. <laughs> What a revolting development this is. Riley will be back in just a moment. Hundreds write us congratulations on Prell, the new radiant cream shampoo in the tube. Voluntary letters pour into Procter & Gamble, like this one from Lillian Bachman of Rochester, New York. There's no dullness after a Prell shampoo. Prell leaves hair so soft, manageable. May I congratulate you on that wonderful new product, Prell. And thank you for your letter. Thousands agree Prell removes unsightly dandruff quickly, leaves hair radiantly lovely. And they like Prell's handy, too. Yes, thousands cheer for... P-R-E-L-L Prell Shampoo Leaves hair radiant, gleaming bright Not a bit of dandruff is inside Comes in the tube too. P-R-E-L-L Folks, this is Riley, alias William Bendix. Daylight saving time ends tomorrow in many localities. If your community has not been operating on daylight saving time, we will be with you one hour later every Saturday from now on. Is that right, Ken? That's right. So please check your local newspaper for the correct time, and we hope you'll be with us. Oh, I will. I never miss it. Good night, folks. <laughs> We'll invite you to join us again next week to hear the life of Riley with William Bendix as Riley. The script is by Alan Lipscott and Reuben Ship. Music by Luke Kozlov. Mrs. Riley is Paula Winslow. Digger O'Dell is John Brown. Babs is Barbara Eiler. And Junior is Tommy Cook. The Life of Riley is produced and directed by Irving Bracker. The chorus queen, the gay blades all eyed her so, kept her finery looking keen with wonderful ivory snow. Ah, wonderful ivory snow. You can keep your pretty dresses and lingerie glamorous longer with wonderful ivory snow. Your hands will tell you why ivory snow keeps lovely washables lovely longer. Here's how to prove it. This week, wash dishes with ivory snow. When you see how it pampers your hands, you'll know it'll pamper your nice things. There's just no other soap like it. 
because Ivory Snow is positively the only granulated soap that's ivory mild. Watch those snowdrops burst into suds in lukewarm, even in cool water. Remember, your hands will tell you why Ivory Snow keeps pretty things lovely longer. Ivory Snow is so kind to your hands, you just know it's kind to sheer nylons, dainty lingerie, and other nice washables. Yes, wonderful Ivory Snow. S N O W. This is Ken Carpenter reminding you that for radiantly clean, lovely hair, get the shampoo and the tube. P R E L L. Prell Shampoo. And listen again next week when Prell brings you The Life of Riley. Good night. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Granny, then I believe that's our ring. I know this llama. I believe you're right. Now we'll see. Hello, jot him down, store. This is Llama and Abner. No. Let's see what's going on down in Pine Ridge. Well, the old fellows are happily engaged in playing nursemaid to their foundling baby. Lum's joy is dimmed only by the fact that Abner will not agree to calling the baby little Lum, while Abner's happiness is marred by matters of braver concern. He still has heard nothing from Elizabeth, his missing wife, and he's certain that his house has become haunted. As we look at our little community today, we find the old fellows in their jot them down store and library. Lum is tiptoeing out of the feed room. Listen. Say, Lum, are we plumb out of sorghum? Not so loud, Abner. Little Leonard's just fell asleep. Oh, who fell asleep? Little Leonard. Huh? I've changed the baby's name to Edward because you appeared to object to calling him Little Lum. Well, I don't like that no better. I'll tell you that right now. You're still naming him after yourself. No, not exactly. There are mean, two. He's got it for a first name, and I've got it for a last name. There's a lot of difference there. I don't see no difference. We're going to do that. Why don't we call him Little Peabody? Yeah, now, let's not argue about it now. We'll figure out some way to get a name for him that'll be satisfaction to both of us. Hey, doggy, that's what I want to do. Well, now, we're liable to wake him up arguing here. Oh, uh-huh. He fell asleep right during my speech. <laughs> <laughs> your speech? Yeah. Was you reading him one of your speeches? Yeah, he seemed to like it, too. That is, till he went to sleep. Well, no wonder he went to sleep if that's what you was doing. Even grown-up folks goes to sleep during them speeches a year. Not this one, they won't. It's a new one. I just wrote I know him. Yeah, I'm giving it at the meeting of the Pine Ridge for Victory Club tonight. Oh, is that meeting tonight? Yeah, yeah starting off that big salvage drive. Well, I never know you was making a speech at that long. Uh, what you talking about? It's uh, about junk. Junk? Yeah. Well, I know that. That's what all your speeches are about. It's the first time I ever heard you come right out flat-footed and admit it, though. I don't mean that kind of junk. I don't know what kind of junk there. I've heard them a million times before. Even as a small boy, I showed great promise of becoming a self-made man you see standing before you this evening. I ain't evening. giving that in tonight, Abner. I'm talking about scrap iron and old copper and brass and rags and all such as that. Things that a giver man needs for the war. Oh, that kind of junk, huh? Yeah. Why don't you sit down there and play like you're the audience and I'll run through my speech for you. See how you like it. Well, I don't want to listen to it long. Well, this is important, Abner. The government's starting this campaign for salvage goods all over the country. Yeah, well, I know that. I'll give all the junk we got, but now I ain't going to listen to no speech of yours. I'll tell you that right now, Long. Well, you'll enjoy this, Abner. I got most of it out of some literature from the government. I sent for it several days ago. Several days? Well, how long ago did the Pine Ridge for Victory Club ask you to make this speech? Well... Now, to be honest, they ain't actually asked me yet. They ain't? No, but I'm not sure they will. Oh. Well, I'm about the best out loud talker they can get around here, I believe. Besides, I'm the only fellow who's got all the information from the government. Well, if they're going to ask you, they better hurry up and do it, hadn't they? Well, don't worry, they will. Who's head of the committee? 
Mr. Sampson. Oh. Have you ever heard of any committee she weren't the head of? No, I reckon not. She generally is the head of everything around here. Uh, here's how it starts out, Emma. Fellow citizens and members of the Pine Ridge for Victory Club. On this auspicious occasion... Mom, I I'm, told you I don't want to hear it. I bring you a message of much importance. Oh, my. Tonight we're beginning a big drive to collect all the scrap we can. Tribble and why are we doing this, fellow citizens? Get in there with To win the war. If we don't collect enough, we might find ourselves on the losing side. And so, fellow citizens, let's all put our shoulders to the wheel. Huh. And if the wheel's made of iron, turn it into the junk man or the salvage collection center. <laughs> That's pretty good there, ain't it? That part about the wheel. Huh? Uh -huh. Some of you folks sitting here before me tonight are more than likely wondering just how old rags and stoves and kettles and such as that can help win the war. Well, I'll Not tell you. Long. That's our ring, I believe. You better answer it. Yeah, blame it. Just when I was getting warmed up, too. Glad that thing wrong. I'll say that. Hello, jot them down store and library. Lum at her yeah, that's a thousand times. Why, hello, Sister Simpson. See, you what that tell you? Uh-huh. Mom? A uh, speech at the meeting tonight. I love speech. Well, I don't know, Sister Simpson. This comes as quite a surprise to me. A surprise? You've been planning on it for days. Well, I'd love to, Sister Simpson, but there ain't much time left to get a speech ready. Why, love, you got one wrote there, a long one, too. Yeah. Ma? Oh, yes, I'm for the campaign, but this is such short notice. Such pretty now, I'll tell you what, you better give me a little time to think it over. <laughs> yes, Ma. Uh-huh. Yeah, all right, Sister Simpson. Goodbye. Well, for the land's sake, Mom, what's the matter with you? Here you've been planning on this, waiting for them to call you, and when they finally do call, you turn them down, hang up a receiver. i never seen you like this in my life. I never turn them down. Huh? I'm going to make the speech, don't you worry. I'm just playing hard to get. Hard to get? Yeah, you see, this way they figure I'm a busy, important fellow, and so when they do finally manage to get me, they'll think my speech is a whole lot more important. And they'll listen to it better. They will, huh? Why, sure. Besides, they'll think I'm pretty smart to be able to think up a good speech like this in such a short time. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas, I'll admit one thing. You sure use your head on. Well, that's what you call psychology. It is, huh? Yeah, let's see now. How far had I got? Huh? Oh, yeah. Part about winning the war. Uh -huh. Some of you folks sitting here before me this evening, more than like here. Uh -huh. I'll ring again, uh -huh. I believe. Sister Simpson, I'll be on you. She's calling back, huh? <laughs> She's starting to beg me to give the talk. Now. Good for you. Yeah, you answer it this time, Emma. Yeah. That'll make it look like I'm too busy to talk on the phone. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll get it. I'll get it. <laughs> Hello, John and Dallas Store Library. Abner Peabody doing the talking. Who? Blindfolded Wildcat. Just a minute. Do you know anybody by the name of the Blindfolded Wildcat, Mom? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's Cedric. Cedric. Oh, sure. That's what he calls himself since he joined up with Mousy and that detective agent. Oh. <laughs> don't you know? Don't you recollect him calling himself yeah, that? Yeah, I recollect. Man, I know I'd hear that name somewhere and never know where it was. Well, he had to get himself a fancy name because Mousy calls himself the Masked Muskrat. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Cedric. What is it you want? Done detective work where? Hang out, Abner. This ain't nothing important. Oh, my goodness. Went past the winder. I know that's what it was all the time. I just knowed it. You know what, Andy? Yeah, listen, Cedric. Uh, you come over to the store as quick as you can, and we'll figure out what to do. Yeah, something like that. Uh, we'll talk it over with Mom. Yeah, all right, Cedric. Goodbye. Huh? Oh, yeah. Wonderful world. Goodbye. Huh? Oh, hi-ho, blindfolded wildcat. <laughs> What did he tell you? He's seen it, Lum. He's seen it right in our upstairs window. He's seen what? The ghost. I know that place was haunted, oh, Lum. Oh, wait a minute, Edna. Don't get excited. Exactly what did Cedric see? I'm telling you, Lum, he's seen a ghost. I told you there weren't no such thing as a ghost. Well, he has done it for last night. Cedric was doing some detective work, and he's seen a light on in an upstairs window over at my place. And so he watched, and finally he seen something dressed in a long white robe, just like a ghost walked past the window, and the light went out. Well, I do know. It must have been his imagination. It weren't either. He claimed he seen it now. You can believe Cedric, you know, he don't get scared very easy, and he sounded like he's about half scared to death. That place is haunted now, I tell you, we got to do something about it, Long. Well, yesterday you didn't want to do nothing about it. Huh? You scared to go near the place. All right, dog, is I've changed my mind. <laughs> 
We'll get Cedric and take some big clubs and go over there tonight and find out about this. Well, we can't tonight, Abner. The meeting's tonight. Oh, well, I know this. We'll go tomorrow night, then. All right. That's the deal. Tomorrow night. Yes, sir. Find out what that is. Well, now listen to the rest of my speech. Oh, my. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Fellow citizens, I'll show you how salvage goods can help win the war. Oh, that's Grandpa. Uh, oh. Yeah, honey, honey, honey. Oh, come in, Grandpa. Uh, you fellas hear about the big meeting tonight? Why, sure we have. Say, you know what Cedric seen? A ghost. Yes, sir, going to be a big meeting tonight. You know anything about this salvage campaign loan? More than anybody else in town, I reckon, Grandpa. If you and Abner will keep quiet for half a minute, I'll tell you all about it. Well, good. That's exactly what I want to hear. Grandpa, Cedric's seen a ghost over at my place. Hey, Chef Abner. Fellow citizens, in modern warfare, battles is won by having more and better guns and tanks and our planes than your enemy. Our place is haunted, Grandpa. Abner, will you be quiet? Huh? That's unpatriotic. Go ahead, go ahead. We got inventors and scientists and engineers that can study up how to build better equipment than our enemy can. That takes care of, of getting better guns and tanks and our planes, but getting more of them is up to you and me. Us citizens has got to collect scrap to help make all that equipment for our soldiers and sailors and marines. That sounds great, Lon, but it ain't true, is it? The government can't actually make stuff out of old iron and kettles and fishes that can they? Why, of course they can. Listen to this. Half of every tank, gun, destroyer, and merchant ship is made out of scrap iron. Think of that, Grandpap. One half, 50 percent. Well, I do know. That means us citizens has got to dig up that 50 percent of scrap iron, or the factories making them things can't keep going. They can't. No, sir. And that's just one item. Huh. The government needs old copper and brass and zinc and lead and rope and burlap bags. Well. Just listen to what I got wrote down here. Yeah. One copper kettle will make 84 rounds of ammunition for an automatic rifle. For the land sake. One washing and ironing machine will make a 37-millimeter tank gun. Huh. One lawnmower will make six three-inch shells. Now, how can a lawnmower do that? All I ever seen them do is just cut grass. Well, I don't mean it that way, Abner. I mean, they take the metal out of the lawnmower and melt it up and use it for the shell. Oh, well, I was going to say I didn't think a lawnmower was smart Just enough a minute, to Lon. Have you got all that stuff wrote down? Of course I have. Well, good. I'll just take that along and use it in my speech. In your speech? Yeah, Sister Simpson asked me to give a talk to at the victory meeting tonight. Huh? She said they had somebody else for it, but he was too slow and couldn't get a speech ready in time. Listen, Anna, tonight Henry Van Porter is giving a party for ichthyologists. Do you know what that means? Well, it must mean something, Amos. I'm going to get me a dictionary and see what Mr. Webbs will say about the thing. Rinso presents the Amos and Andy Show. Yes, the makers of Rinso bring you the Amos and Andy Show with their guest tonight, the star of Take It or Leave It, Phil Baker. Everybody in Harlem who is anybody has been invited to a party being given by Henry Van Porter in honor of Professor Newkirk, an eminent ichthyologist, and his daughter Amanda, who have just arrived from the South. Andy, Amos, and the Kingfish have all received invitations, and at the moment Andy is consulting a dictionary to find out just what an ichthyologist is. Yeah, what do the dictionary say, Diane, about ichthyologists? Yeah, read it out loud, Andrew. Well, say he is a scientific student of fishes. Oh, Andy, is you kidding? I uh, know that's what it is, fellas. I remember Henry telling me about this uh, Professor Newkirk. His life's work is just studying fish. And he's the one that Henry's giving the party for, you know. Well, he can count me out. I ain't going. Oh, uh, why not, Andrew? Well, I just don't see where a fish peddler's got no place in society. Oh, listen, fella, this Professor Newkirk is a big scientist. Uh, they got a story in today's paper about him. Uh, yes, he is right there. Here's the paper. Well, I ain't going to no party give for him. Now, I know that. All right, let's see the paper, Emma. Uh, there he is. There's a picture of him. Well, I ain't interested in nothing about a fish man. 
Uh, who was the good-looking gal in the picture there with him? Uh, that's his daughter, Amanda. Oh, uh, where? Uh, here. What time is the party? Yes, boys, I think this reception that we're given for Professor Newkirk will be one of the big social affairs of the season. Yeah, and the professor sure got a pretty daughter, too. Tell me this, is there going to be a lot of other single men there, Henry? Yes, Andy, I imagine you'll have quite a bit of competition for the young lady. Oh, yeah, the wolves is going to be howling. Yes, and I positively know that the one who will appeal to her most is the type of man that's got the same interests as her and her father. Yeah, well, I got a tie pin with a fish on it. Uh, that might make a hit with her. Yeah, Andy, and the fact that them feet of yours look like flounders, that might be a wedge for you, too, you know. Well, one thing I'm sure of, it's going to be the man with intelligence in the upper brackets that's going to strike her fancy. Well, boys, I'll see you both at the party tomorrow night, then. I got a lot of things to do. So long, boys. Yeah, so long, Henry, so long. See you tomorrow night, Henry. Say, Kingfish, I was just thinking here, what is the best way to show this gal a man that I as intelligent? Well, Andrew, uh, that ain't a weird uh, question to answer. Be perfectly frank with you. If that gal is looking for intelligence, after she talks to you for 30 seconds, she's going to know that you ain't no Professor Weinstein. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that I might have... Well, oh, how are you there, fellas? Yeah. Well, say, I'm glad I found you here, Andrew. What's the matter, Amos? I was just downtown in my taxi cab hauling a passenger, and when I got back up here in Harlem, I discovered that the man done left his briefcase in my taxi cab. Well, why don't you take it back to him? Yeah, well, it's just that I got another passenger in the cab now, and I can't do it. So, Andy, I was wondering if, if you would take it down in the subway for me. I sure would appreciate it. Mm, yeah, sure. I ain't got nothing to do. Oh, thanks, Andy. I dropped the man off at a house, and here's the number of it. And if you look inside the briefcase, you might find the man's name in there somewhere. I got to run along now, so thanks again, Andy. So long, son. Okay. Oh, uh, nice-looking briefcase there. Yeah. Sure is. Let's see who the fellow's name is that this belonged to. Mm-hmm. Uh, hmm. Here's some papers with a letter on it. What's that? Let's see what it say here. Uh, Mr. Phil Baker. Oh, uh, Phil Baker? Yeah. Say, uh, he's the fellow on the radio that's got that uh, Take It or Leave It program. Yeah, that's right. Ain't he the fellow that you, he asks you your name, and if you know the answer, he gives you $64? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, say, uh, uh, look what the letter say here. Listen to this. Uh, Dear Mr. Baker, attached to this letter are the various uh, questions and answers for your various categories for this Sunday's broadcast. Categories? What that mean, Kingfrey? Well, uh, that mean, uh, uh, well, look, and the word don't always have to mean something, you know. Just, uh, <laughs> uh, well, why does they stick it in there? Well, uh, what it do... Uh, it kind of gives the sentence class and don't change the meaning of it. You see what I mean? Yeah, well, that's a good thing, all right. Oh, yeah, well, just let's read the sentence and leave the word category out. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, dear Mr. Baker, attach to this letter all the questions and answers for your various for this Sunday's broadcast. You see, it's just as good without the word in there. Yeah, I like it even better. Yeah, you got something there. You know, and uh, I bet a lot of the contestants would like to get a hold of these questions and answers for Sunday's broadcast. Yeah. Hey, yeah, look here. Number one, music. With all the questions and answers about music. Look at that. Show sure is. Number two, flowers. And there's the questions and answers about them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, hey, wait a minute. What's the matter, Kingfish? Uh, Brother Andrew, the thing that is topmost in your mind right now is to get in good with this professor's daughter, ain't it? That's right. If I was able to guarantee you that I would make you the head man with this gal and make a little extra money on the side, uh... <laughs> Would you be willing to split that money with me? I'll say I would. It's a deal, Brother Ander. Yeah. Look here at this next thing. Fish, F-I-S-H, with all the questions and answers. And that's what the professor studies. Yeah, sure is. Now, look here. Before we take this stuff back to Mr. Phil Baker, let's copy down all the questions and answers about fish for this Sunday's broadcast. Then we get you on the program, and, of course, you know all the answers. Oh, wait a minute now. Wait a minute, King Fish. Ain't that cheating? Cheating? Yeah. And we're only learning the answers to the questions, educating ourselves. <laughs> uh, would you call going to Harvard for four years cheating? Well, 
No. Yeah, well, that's what we're doing. Uh, just like going to Harvard, only we're taking a short cut, that's all. <laughs> Kingfish, I'll do it. Right. Yeah, here's the place right here, Kingfish. Yeah, now remember, Andy, when we goes in, don't let Mr. Baker know that we knows who he is. Mm -hmm. Now, if we calls him Mr. Baker, then he'll know that we done open up the briefcase. And he'll figure that we might have done see the questions and answers, and that spoiled everything. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll push the bell here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We don't know that he's Phil Baker, and so when we find it out, we act surprised. Uh, that's the idea. Oh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what can I... Oh, my briefcase. Thank goodness. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, sir. Here you are, mister. Uh, come in, fellas. Come in. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, thank sir. you. Yeah, sir. Tell me, where'd you find it? I've been going crazy. Well, uh, you left it in a friend of ours' taxi cab, and uh, he told us where he dropped you off, and we done bring it down here to you. Yes, sir. And on top of that, we ain't got the faintest idea who you is. Uh, that's right, mister. And the reason we don't know who he is is because we ain't never looked in the briefcase. <laughs> Oh, I see. Yeah, naturally, if we looked in the briefcase, we'd have known you was Phil Baker. <laughs> oh, but you don't know who I am now. He ain't got the faintest idea. I know this is a very silly question, but not having looked in the briefcase, how did you know that my name would have been Phil Baker if you had looked in the briefcase? Well, I, uh, uh, is, uh... Yeah, that is a silly question, all right. Oh, yeah, so let's skip that one, if you will, please. Uh. Well, boy, since you don't know my name is Phil Baker, let me introduce myself. My name is Phil Baker. Not, Not Phil, Phil Baker. Baker. I knew that would surprise you. Oh, I tell you, you could have knocked us both over with a fella. Me too. Yeah. Boys, since you were nice enough to return this briefcase to me, I'd like to do something for you. Now, um... Let's see. How would five dollars be? Oh no, oh, no, 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 no. We wouldn't accept no money, Mr. Baker. We, well, we just done it as a favor to you. Yeah, I tell you though, uh, there is one thing you could do. Uh, uh, you see, your program is our favorite, and uh, if uh, you could give us a couple of tickets uh, to go see it while we show Priestley. Why, certainly. I've got some right here. Here's two for you. How's that? Oh, that's uh, great. Yeah, we'll be right down in the first row. Yeah, and uh, one other thing, Miss Baker, just in case you were looking for a contestant on the night of the program, I'll let you in on a little something here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Brown here is a genius. Oh, really? Well, it isn't often that I meet a genius. Oh, uh, yes, uh, I guess there's only a few of us left. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Brown on my program, eh? Say, it might not be a bad idea to have another genius on the program. Say, Amos, don't you think we get into the Van Porter reception too early? Here's the house right here. Yeah, well, it might be a little early, but that's all right, Andy. You know, I was so anxious to meet this Professor Newkirk's daughter, Amanda. I know you. And when she finds out that I is intelligent and knows all about fish, she's going to fall for me like a ton of brick. Yeah, well, here we are, son. I'll ring the bell. Yo, yeah, well, wait a minute. Here, uh, let me put my eyeglasses on here. Uh -huh. See, I got the kind of sits on your nose with a black ribbon hanging down. See, Andy, what you doing wearing glasses? Well, you ain't never seen a big scientist without glasses, is you? Hey, they sure high class looking, all right. Ain't them the kind they call the uh, pins nails? Yeah. Well, they is the best kind for men that studies fish. Uh, you can see through them, and they hold your nose at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> well, come in, gentlemen. Come in. Come in. Outside of the professor and his daughter, you is the first ones here. Yeah. Well, I go over and say hello to your wife, Henry. All right, Amos. And Andy, I want you to be the guest of honor. Yeah, I sure like that. Oh, Professor Newkirk, Amanda, I want you to meet a very dear friend of mine, Mr. Andrew H. Brown. How do you do, Mr. Brown? How do you do? Oh, I was pleased to make both of you acquaintances. Well, you'll excuse me. I think there's somebody else at the door. That's quite all right. Well, uh, Professor Newkirk, uh, it's a great pleasure to meet another ichorologist like I is. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Brown. And it goes without saying that I was always happy to meet a Icarologist's daughter, too. Oh, that's very kind of you, Mr. Brown. Yes, I always love the study of fish. Truth of the thing is, I hangs around the fish market most of the time. 
Uh, most of the time? Uh, well, uh, not on the hot days, of course. <laughs> uh, I got a big laboratory, too, you know. Thing holds four quarts. I got two goldfish in it. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown, I hate to tear myself away, but I think I'll walk out and get a breath of fresh air. Uh, certainly, Professor, certainly. Well, Mr. Brown, as a noted ichthyologist, I guess you've made quite a few discoveries. Well, uh, there's one discovery I done made. And what is that? You is the prettiest gal I done ever see. <laughs> Why, Mr. Brown, well, science is certainly making remarkable progress. Honey, get them down to brass tacks and forget them to warm up. I want to say that I loves you with all my heart. <laughs> oh, now, Mr. Brown, I can hardly believe that. Oh, it's the truth. And I ain't never said that to no other professor's daughter in my whole life, neither. Well, I think you're very nice, too. Ah, that settles it. How about you having a date with me Sunday night as my guest? Why, that sounds wonderful. Where will we go? Well, uh... You and your father just stay in your hotel and listen to me on the radio. Oh, are you going to be on the radio? Oh, sure, on the Take It or Leave It program with Phil Baker. And then, of course, after the program, why, I'll come up to your hotel and we'll all go out together. How did that sound? Oh, it sounds very exciting. You're going on a quiz show. You know, Mr. Brown, there's nothing that I admire more than an alert, well-informed, intelligent man. You know, honey. <laughs> Uh, I has made the order for you. Tonight, Andy is going to attend the Phil Baker broadcast with a kingfish while Professor Newkirk and his daughter Amanda listen in. After the little hint they drop, the boys feel certain Mr. Baker will call on Andy to act as one of the contestants. Right now, Andy and the kingfish are in the office making sure that Andy will not only win the money, but also greatly impress the girl. Now, Brother Andy, here is all the questions and answers that Mr. Baker going to ask you on his program tonight. Yeah, I got to memorize them, ain't I? Now, all you got to do is to memorize the answers in this one thing, ichthyology. Hmm. Uh, that's the category number three, you see. Forget about the rest of them. Okay. Now, take the first question. Oh, uh, here, you see, he usually starts off by asking a silly one. Uh, what fish, if it could make a sound, would go meow? Of course, the answer here is catfish. I wonder if I can remember that. Yeah, well, you don't have to remember the whole thing. Just, uh, just catfish is the answer to the first question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, now on the second uh, the one there, the answer is uh, sardine. Now, just remember that. You don't have to know the question. Yeah, oh, the answer is the important thing, yeah. That's all I got to say up there, huh? Yeah, well, cool. Now, Mr. Baker might ask you a few personal questions, make jokes about them, you know, or... You know, what your name is and where you live. He might even ask you what you do for a living. You going to make a joke about that? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, that don't give much to get his teeth in to do it. Uh, uh, anyway, Andy, uh, you spend the rest of the afternoon now memorizing these answers. Then you and me will go down to the broadcasting studio about 9.30. Yeah, and by then I'll know these answers better than my own name. Now, remember, Andy... Right after the broadcast, you got to give me half of the $64 that you're going to win. Oh, sure. So as soon as you come off the stage, why, you have the $42 ready for me. Yeah, I'm going to... Well, wait a minute. Is 42 half of 64? Well, I certainly it is, Andrew. Shows sound like a big half, don't it? <laughs> uh, Brother Andrew, I want to be fair about this thing. If you like my half better, then you can take it and I'll take the other 42 yeah, if you don't mind, Kingfish, I'd rather do it that way. Yeah. All right, folks, we're going to be on the air in about ten minutes, and we still need one more contestant. I'll draw another number. Here we are, number twelve. Mm. Number twelve. Oh, oh, that's me. That's me. Why, uh, uh... Number 12, step right up here, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'd be glad to, Mr. Baker. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, now, don't climb over the footlights. Just come up those steps on the side. Oh, oh, yeah. Excuse me. Excuse me. I, uh, 
Kingfish, can I get my feet through here? Oh, uh, yeah. Take off your derby, too, Andy. And look here, remember category number three, the answer to the first question is catfish. I know, Kingfish. I know, I know. Right up those steps there. That's right. Now, if you'll just sit over there with the other contestants. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I say, we'll be on the air in a few minutes. Let me know and... when you're ready for me, Mr. Baker. <laughs> oh, yes. I'll be sure and let you know. As I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be on the air in a few minutes. We want to give all the people listening in a good show. Uh, Mr. Baker, the $64 I'm going to win, uh, you pay that in cash, don't you? <laughs> Say, take it easy there. You might not win it. Oh, Mr. Baker, can I speak with you a minute over here, please? Certainly, Charlie. Sit tight, folks. I'll be right back. Say, Phil, the sponsor insists on changing the categories. Inasmuch as the questions and answers were out of your hands for a while. All right. I didn't think it made any difference, but if that's the way they want it, fine. Well, here are the new questions and answers. Well, how about changing the categories on the blackboard? Well, I'm having the boy do that now before they take the blackboard out on the stage. Well, I guess there's no harm in making the change. Certainly won't make any difference to anybody. This is Phil Baker following through with Take It or Leave It, and here's our next contestant coming up to the microphone. Oh, yeah, 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 sir, yeah, sir, coming up, yeah, sir, yeah. I hope you're not nervous. No, no, sir, no, sir, I've I, 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 I just shaken because I was cold. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Uh, what is your name? Catfish. <laughs> your name is Catfish? Oh, oh, no, 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 sir. my name is Andrew H. Brown. All right, tell me, Mr. Brown, have you selected a category? Just look up there on the board, and you can pick anyone you want. Yeah, well, I don't have to look on the board. I take number three. Oh, zoology, huh? Mm, well, it ends with ology. I know that. <laughs> All right, I'll ask you the first question. Catfish. <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't know whether it's too important, but I haven't asked you the question yet. Well, irregardless of the question, that's the answer. <laughs> Well, all right, you've got a dollar. And in case the sponsor is listening in, I'll pay this out of my own pocket. <laughs> Would you like to try for two bucks? Yes, sir. All right, here we go for two dollars. What animal, now virtually extinct, used to roam the plains in the far west? A sardine. <laughs> I hate to see you lose out in the contest so early. Is it possible that you're talking about a sardine on the order of a buffalo? Uh, yes, sir. Sort of a water buffalo, huh? Uh, yes, sir. That gives right. you two bucks. That's fine. Now, uh, <laughs> would you like to try it before? Oh, uh, yes, sir. All right. The third question. Tell me, do you know what an elephant is? Yes, sir. For not saying catfish, you get four dollars. <laughs> would you like to try for eight? Well, well, could we skip the eight and get right down to the sixty-four? <laughs> Not so fast, my friend. Next question. Uh, this is question number four, ain't it? Right. There's a well-known saying about the elephant that you must know. Can you tell me what it is the elephant never does? Goes up the Columbia River to spawn. <laughs> well, that's not exactly the answer I have down here. <laughs> but who am I to say you aren't right? You've got eight dollars. <clears throat> By the way, just for my own information, are all your answers going to be about fish? Well, naturally, that's what category number three is all about, isn't it? Oh, I think I'm beginning to see a light. Well, Mr. Brown, that brings up a question in my mind. Well, if it's number five, they breathe through their gills. <laughs> Let me see what question number five is. How do mother bears recognize their own cubs? And you say they breathe through their gills. The elephants and bears are certainly doing strange things this year, aren't they? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's apparent to everyone that these answers don't fit the questions like a glove. As a matter of fact, this is the first time in the history of Take It or Leave It that anyone has gone through this many questions without even getting on the subject. <laughs> Well, can I help it if you don't know the right question? <laughs> Mr. Brown, it's obvious that your chief interest in life is fish. Yes, sir. And without going any further, I'm going to declare you a winner. Oh, thank you. Sir. I hereby award you 64 cans of sardines. <laughs> Amanda, 
this is Andy. Uh, yeah, did you hear the broadcast? Oh, you did, huh? Hey, lay it on there, son. I can hear you now. Yeah, well, well uh, what is that? Yeah, well, uh, well, but Amanda, you can't do that. Well, I was figuring on me and you having a little sardine supper together. <laughs> well, yeah, but honey, I... Well, I know, but... Uh... Yeah, she done hung up on you, ain't she, son? Yeah. Well, Amos, I guess I done missed again. Yeah. Well, you know, what did she say to you, Andy? Well, she says you never want to see me again. Why? Well, she done heard me on the radio and say that I was stupid and dumb. And by pretending that I was an expert on the science of fishes, she say I was even lying about that, too. Well, Andy, that's what happens whenever you try to pretend that you are somebody that you ain't. Yeah, that's the reason for the whole mess, all right. And I've done told you all your life that you has got to cut out pretending. You has got to be yourself. No matter how humble a man is, you'll find that people will love you for just being yourself. That's all you got to do. Mm-hmm. And believe me, Andy, you'll do much better with everything in life. Yeah, Amos, you're right. Won't you shake hands with me on it, Andy? Why don't you start today? It ain't too late, Andy. You is a nice enough guy. Yeah, Amos put it there. Oh, that's the stuff. You is right. I was crazy to think that I could make that gal believe that I was a big ichorologist. From now on, I ain't going to make people believe nothing that I ain't and all that stuff. I ain't going to... Bu- I... uh, wait a minute, who is this coming in? Pardon me, but could either of you gentlemen tell me where the Harlem Art Gallery is? Uh, yeah, I know where it is. Uh, what you want to go there for, miss? Well, I'm an art student, and they're having an exhibit of paintings up there. There is, huh? Well, now, uh, how about me walking up there with you? It just so happened that I, as a great painter myself... (laughs) All right, here's Amos and Abby again. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we just want to thank you for listening in, and we hope you enjoyed our show. Thanks for me, too, folks. Next week, we are going to have as our guest that fine actor of stage and screen, Mr. Raymond Massey. And, as usual, is going to be in trouble up to his neck. I is? Oh, me. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Good night, folks. Sure and be with us next week at this same time, friends. Bill Baker appears through the courtesy of the Evershot Company. The George Burns and Gracie Allen Show for Hormel and Spam. Crazy people. Spam, rip up, boom, spam. George Burns and Gracie Allen. Oh, the show where the dog gets star for singing glee with a smoothie three. Last but not least, and the wizard he sings. <laughs>
way to have fun on Monday night is to listen to Burns and Allen. And how to make school lunches that get A plus is a question you can answer with spam. S P A M. In any youngster's language, spam is a word for delicious meat. Tender, tasty meat that's all ready to eat as soon as you open the can. Hormel originated spam and gave busy mothers this new combination of meat seasoned in a better way. Whether you pack a lunch box or the children rush home at noon, spam is a time saver that gives your youngsters good food, husky appetites need. Try spam tomorrow for lunch. Use the easy recipes on the label, and you'll discover the way to make school lunches easier to get, better to eat. <laughs> Those two lovable stars of our big happy family, George and Gracie. Hi, everybody. Hello, George will be here in a minute. Oh, wait till you see him. He's all slicked up. He's wearing a full dress suit with tails and everything. He must be going to some swell place because this time he had both hands manicured. Well. Well, Gracie, a, a full dress suit? Yes. Where's George going? Well, I don't know. See, maybe he's going to the UCLA football team play. Maybe he's going to see them. No, no, that's impossible. UCLA hasn't got a football team. <laughs> maybe maybe he's got a date with Brenda and Cobina. No, nobody wants a date bad enough to go out with George. <laughs> I know. Maybe he's gone over to John Barrymore's party to help him celebrate his divorce. He always goes to those. <laughs> then maybe again, he he's got to watch that. Percy. How do I look? <laughs> Stop laughing. Stop laughing. The reason I'm wearing this full dress suit is because the sponsor is coming here tonight. Right after the show, I'm taking him out. <laughs> What's so funny? I'll admit that this isn't exactly an Eastern style suit. You see, they're worn out in the West. It's a little worn out in the south, too. <laughs> well, you may not believe this, but this is a very expensive suit. The vest happens to be satin. Satin? <laughs> Looks more like it's been slept in. <laughs> well, forget the suit. Now listen, everybody. When the sponsor, the sponsor gets here, I, I, I want, I want, I want every, I want. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like somebody is following me. <laughs> what is it, Senor Lee? Uh, Senor Burns, that's a very loose-fitting suit. <laughs> you mean loose-fitting? Uh, in that suit, you look like that movie star Robert Trailer. <laughs> it's Taylor. A trailer is something that drags behind. You guessed it. <laughs> Artie, will you talk to that guitar player of yours? Okay, George, leave it to me. Senor, if you don't stop insulting Mr. Burns about his clothes, he'll hit you over your head with his baseball bat. That's... What the... What baseball bat? The one you got with that suit. <laughs> Never mind the suit. After the sponsor get here, gets here tonight, I'm going to take him over to Ciro's and then to the theater and then to the Coconut Grove and then to all the night spots. Well, aren't you and... taking an awful chance, George? What do you... What do you mean an awful chance? Well, supposing he runs out of money. <laughs> Oh, quiet. You were with me last night when I had 12 people out for dinner. And when the waiter came over and said, who shall I give the check to? I fought and fought and fought. Remember? Yeah. But you had to pay it anyway. <laughs> well, anyway, you'll have to admit that the drinks were on me and the steaks were on me. And... Yep, and the ketchup is still on you. <laughs> Artie, will you go away? Oh, don't mind him, George. That's a nice-looking suit. Thanks, Bert. Spots. <laughs> But when the sponsor gets here, you just talk about spam. Okay. When he comes in, I'll say, your coat fits very well over those pork shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's... But that's no way to get in the plug. You're just like Don Wilson. And that's why Jack Benny is sore at him. No, it isn't. No? No. Then why is Jack Benny sore at Don Wilson? Well, if he told him once, he told him five times. <laughs> Call up your wife. Let's not fall in on the And, Artie, there's something that's very important. The sponsor's favorite song is Blueberry Hill. So I want you to play it tonight. Senor Burns, I do not like it. You do not like Blueberry Hill? No. Why not? The seeds get in my ears. <laughs> well, anyway, Artie, tonight you play it. Well, how does it go, George? Well, I found my thrill 
in Blueberry Hill. You better throw yourself into second if you want to make that hill. Well, just play it. I'll shift for myself. Now, let me see. Is everything all set for the sponsor? Oh, yes. Gracie, did you buy that gold cigarette case I told you to get from? Well, I went shopping for it this morning. And those Christmas crowds are terrible. I know, you I know, but did you get the case? Look, you should have seen the way two women were fighting over a little pair of shoes. Gracie, the cigarette case. One woman grabbed one shoe, another woman grabbed another shoe. Look, Gracie. Well, I had to walk home barefooted. <laughs> Gracie, did you get the cigarette case? Well, I'm coming to that. So anyway, I'm in the middle of a big crowd, and I'm walking past the elevator. Now, let's not get into that. Well, you can't help it when the crowd is pushing you. <laughs> All right, so you got into the elevator. Did you get the cigarette case? No. No? They were on the fourth floor. Well, where did you go? To Glendale with a man. <laughs> what man? I don't know. You don't know? No. You didn't know him. Why did you go to Glendale? I had to. My things got tied up in his package. So, why didn't you untie the string? I couldn't. It said on the package, do not open until Christmas. Oh, I see. <laughs> and now the smoothies, Bab, Charlie, and Little will sing Argentina. Gracie, I told you to get that cigarette. <laughs> You'll find your life will begin the very moment you're in Argentina. If you're romantic, senor, then you will surely adore Argentina. You'll be as gay as can be if you will learn to see sea like Aladdin. For if as soon as you learn, then you will never return to Manhattan. When you hear your te amo, just feel a kiss and then. If she should say mañana, it's just to let you know. You're gonna meet again. I better know, kiss and grab, that you will never forget Argentina. Well, there are rumors and tangos to tickle your spine. Moonlight and music and orchids and wine. You want to stay down on the way. Your life will begin the very moment you're in Argentina. If you're romantic, senor, then you will surely adore Argentina. You'll be as gay as can be if you will learn to see sea like Aladdin. Oh, Mr. as soon you land, you never will return to Manhattan. Oh, hey, yo, hey, yo, mo. Gracie, tell me, did you or didn't you get that cigarette case? I'm coming to that. So, I finally got to the men's department and there was the most marvelous sale on electric razors. So you got the sponsor an electric razor? Well, I would have, except for one thing. What was that? Well, I didn't know whether his face was AC or DC. <laughs> Look, Gracie, how many years have you lived in a coma? Two. Then we moved to Seattle. <laughs> AC or DC. Look, the next time I want an idiot to buy something for me, I'll go myself. <laughs> Thank you. You mean I said... Wait a minute, I said something funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you bagel Just, just look at the charm. Uh-huh. Take it, take it, take it. Take it, take it, take it. Me, Senor Burns, if you want to give the sponsor a nice gift, why don't you buy him a potato clock? A potato clock? Si, sí, senor. You set the alarm and it wakes you up potato clock. <laughs> Well, next week, do me a favor and oversleep. Hey, sound man. Hey, four years in Harvard. Open the door. Just one moment, Mr. Bird. Well, I dropped my Phi Beta Kappa key and I'm looking for it. Hmm. Well, pay a little more attention to your job. You know, it's the little things in life that make you successful. You know that I wouldn't be on the radio today if it weren't for one little thing. 
Yes, she is kind of cute, isn't she, Mr. Burke? <laughs> well, never mind that, and just open the door. Hello, Mr. Burke. Oh, hello, Mr. Phillips. I've been expecting you. Has the sponsor arrived yet? Uh, no, there's a car at the airport waiting to bring him here. Though. Oh, good. Gang, this is Martin Phillips of our advertising agency. Oh, oh, and he's known the sponsor for years. Yes, and I haven't seen him for years. Well, anyway, as a friend of the boss, Mr. Phillips, one of his likes and dislikes. Well, his favorite relaxation is a book and a good cigar. Well, that's easy. I'll read to him and George can smoke to him. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Phillips, what cigars does he like best? Uh, Panatella's. Panatellas? Yes, and he smokes two or three boxes a week. You mean besides the cigars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what he means. He say, smokes big empty boxes. George? Yes? Uh, I just made up a new poem that the sponsor might like. Nobody wants to hear it, but I'd like to hear it. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> well, here it is. Little Jack Horner sat in the corner eating his Christmas pie. He stuck in his spam and pulled out some spam. It doesn't fit, but I try. <laughs> That's very good, young man, but I don't think the sponsor would care for that. You see, he doesn't like exaggerated plugs. See, but what did I tell you? He doesn't mind your saying that Spam is delicious pork shoulder with ham meat added, or that Spam is wonderful for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or that it doesn't need refrigeration. I see. That's what he wants. Yes. Yes, he insists on the plugs being subtle. <laughs> subtle. Well, whatever the sponsor does is good enough for me. I've admired him for years, and when he gets here, I'm going to tell him just how I feel. Oh, no, 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 Miss Byrne. You've got to be very careful about too much flattery. The sponsor is a very modest man. Oh, well, then he ought like my sister, Betsy, on account of she's very modest, too. Now, Betsy, I'll never Betsy, forget... I know your sister is modest, but, but we're she, not interested She even in complained to the police because the people six blocks away didn't pull their shades down when they were undressing. How can she see people six blocks away? She has a telescope. <laughs> Mr. Phillips, does the boss have any special hobby? Well, he likes to hunt. Well, that sort of lets me out. You see, I don't do any hunting. Well, Senor Burns. What is it, Senor Lee? Maybe the sponsor would like to go deer shopping with me. Deer shopping? See, it's not shopping, it's shooting. Oh. You should say shooting deer or hunting deer. I'm sorry, darling. <laughs> Arnie, will you stop that guitar player from butting in? Okay, George, tell me what he said, and I'll punch him right in the nose. I'm sorry, darling. Don't worry, honey, I won't hurt him. <laughs> quiet, quiet. Look, Mr. Phillips, what does the sponsor like to do? Well... I mean, what does his average day consist of? Well, his alarm clock rings at 6.30. Well, doesn't that wake him up? <laughs> well, certainly, that's what it's... That's, doesn't it wake him up? That's what it's for. Oh. Well, then he takes a shower, shaves, shampoos his hair, manicures his nails, brushes his teeth, massages his face. Is he always that much trouble to himself? <laughs> Please, Gracie, go ahead. And then he spends about an hour dressing. He's very fussy about his appearance. He looks well-dressed, and he likes everybody else to look well-dressed. You see, everybody? And you all laugh at me. And he likes everybody to be well-dressed. That's right, Mr. Burns. So if I were you... I, I'd take off that suit. <laughs> and now, dig a dig a doo played by Artie Shaw, his clarinet, and his boys. Gee whiz, how could Jack Benny rent me a suit like this? <laughs>
The most popular new meat item brought out in the generation. Look, we have uh, to... But uh, the sponsor is listening in. Uh, She'll put a little more emphasis on your words. Uh, Accent the T's. Uh, Why, popular new meat uh, hits the spot. Uh, I get it. Heat. Well, good. <laughs> Friends, Spam is the number one choice with the housewives of America. This delicious meat... That's it. ...leads the parade because it's... <laughs> it's <just tight>. <laughs> <laughs> But you see, friends, Spam is a combination of meats originated by Hormel, seasoned in a better way, and put in a handier package. You don't have to be a good cook to make Spam taste good. Spam really has a finer flavor because we use pork shoulder meat, sometimes called picnic, to make Spam sweet and juicy, and the ham it takes to give Spam extra flavor and goodness. There's the difference, the reason Spam tastes so good, fried, served cold, or baked. For example, give the family Spam and eggs for breakfast. It's so easy. Just open a can of Spam, cut off slices, and fry quickly in a hot pan. Those golden brown, sizzling hot slices of Spam really hit the spot. And that's the way to please your family. So you will always be sure of getting the real thing. Look for this sentence. Pork shoulder meat with ham meat added right on the label of the Spam can. Make your meal getting easier with tender, delicious, taste-tempting Spam. Get a can or two when you shop tomorrow. Slice it, dice it, fry it, bake it, cold or hot, spam hits the spot. Oh, George, don't worry. When the sponsor gets here, take him to the lawn party. Lawn party? Did you ever see anybody in a suit like this going to a lawn party? For as long? <laughs> Well, I'm going out to change my suit. I've got to entertain the sponsor. Where's he going to find one funnier than the one he's got on? Hello, Gracie Allen, Sam Meathoff speaking. Good evening. I'm from Western Union. Well, this certainly is a small world. I'm from San Francisco. <laughs> I have a telegram for George Burns. Message from sponsor. Uh, will you read it? Sorry, had to cancel trip. Stop. Urgent business. Stop. Let her follow. Stop. Regard. Stop. What are all the stops for? My boss is trying to kiss me. Stop! <laughs> Why did you hear that? The sponsor can't get here tonight. Yeah, George's going to feel awful. Well, so what? I felt pretty bad when they put up a 12-foot fence between my house and Clark Gables. But I got over it. <laughs> Boy, when George finds out the sponsor isn't coming... Come in. Which one of you is George Burns? Oh, well, Mr. Burns isn't here right now. Oh, he's certainly a hard man to meet. I've been trying to see him for a month. I'm a radio actor, and I'd like to get a job with him. I'll work for almost nothing. Well, you've come to the right place, brother. <laughs> oh. I, I need money badly. I'm sleeping in the park. Well, it shouldn't cost much money to sleep in the park. Well, the landlord is holding my trunks. Oh, is that better than steak to pin? <laughs> Oh, I, I play all kinds of characters, taxi cab drivers and waiters, gangsters, bankers, businessmen, executives. Well, Mr. Burns won't be able to talk to you tonight. He's looking for the sponsor. Oh, oh well, I, I can play a sponsor, too. Uh, listen. 
Gentlemen, what we need is more sales appeal. Hey, wait a minute. There's an idea. Gracie, why can't this fellow be the sponsor? Well, sure. Why should George be disappointed, huh? Hey, I think we've hit on something. Look, you've got the job, mister. Come back in five minutes, and remember, you're the sponsor. Oh, thank you. I- I'm sure Mr. Burns will be pleased with my acting. You know, this is our chance to put George in a spot. We'll embarrass him in front of the sponsor, and he'll have to give us a raise to shut us up. Ooh, what an idea. Thanks. Aren't you glad I thought of it? You thought of it. <laughs> well, maybe now I'll look a little better. Hey, oh, the sponsor's in here. No, George, but he phoned, and he'll be here in a few minutes. Well, good. And then when we go out tonight, I'll tell him a few of my funny stories. I bet I'll get a rise out of him. Mm, I bet we'll get a raise out of him. <laughs> raise? If anybody dares to mention money when he gets here, there'll be plenty of trouble. Well, we can all use a little more money. Look at poor Artie Shaw. Has to play a clarinet full of holes. <laughs> well, let me warn you people. Not one word about money when the sponsor gets here. Because that'll be very embarrassing to me. When he arrives, I want you to be dignified, watch me, and follow my example. You see, I know how to talk with the upper set. Yeah, but you sound much clearer when you're wearing the lower set, too. <laughs> well, never mind. The most important thing is dignity. Please. I don't... That might be... Now, plenty of dignity. Mm. Come in. Mr. Burns? Yes? I'm very happy to be here. I'm your sponsor. Well, I'm very glad to see you. Shake hands with Miss Allen. Well, well, well. So you're Miss Allen. Well, how do you say? I get a wham out of shaking the hand that makes the stem. <laughs> Crashy, please. It comes out of the can. <laughs> Crashy, the sponsor. Want me to squam? Mm. Crashy, I told you how to act. Oh, you want me to be formal with hormal? Formal with hormal? <laughs> Why not? That's normal. <laughs> Crashy, you're losing your dignity. Oh, that thing showing again. <laughs> well, uh, 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 this is uh, Bud Easton. How do you do? I do as well as I can on the salary I get. Uh, that's, a, that's a very large salary, I might add uh, And this is Artie Shaw, one of the world's greatest musicians This is indeed a pleasure I've been waiting for this chance to meet you, Sponge <clears throat> uh, uh, don't, uh, don't mind him, uh, you see, he's nervous Oh, don't be embarrassed, Mr. Burns I understand these things There's one thing I learned in college Pardon and... me, sir Did I hear you say you went to college? Yes, that's what he said, sound man Thank goodness After six months on this program It's a pleasure to meet someone who's gone further than grammar school Well (laughs) I myself am a Harvard graduate Let me shake your hand Oh, thanks, sir I graduated from Yale (laughs) You're a Yale man? Why, yes I'll be right back, Mr. Burns. Where are you going? Downstairs to wash my hands. <laughs> well, uh, I, I really, I really don't know what to say. I'm sorry that happened. I understand, Mr. Burns. Yeah, Artie, I'm going to tell George right here and now. Where did he get that stuff? Where did he think he? Wait a minute, Gracie. What is this? Tell me what. Well, Christmas is coming, and Artie Shaw wants a raise, and Bud Heaston wants a raise, and Senioli wants a raise. Chrissy, aren't you forgetting yourself? That's right, I want a raise, too. Hmm. <laughs> Chrissy, what about the sponsor? He's getting enough now. Quiet! <laughs> Quiet! A raise, give people a raise at my salary. Do you know what costs me $50,000 a year to live? It ain't worth it. <laughs> Quiet, Artie. Uh, Mr. Burns, I feel obliged to interfere. I think these people have done a wonderful job all season, and I think they deserve a raise. Well, I'm sorry, but I just can't do it. I think you should. Well, I'm sorry that you can't see it my way, but, well, they either continue working for the same salary or I quit. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, he, he's even better than Betty Davis in the letter. <laughs> Uh, now, 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 wait a minute, everybody. This is no laughing matter. Mr. Burns looks serious, and if you really quit, you'll all be out of work. And take the advice of an actor who's been out of work, it's no fun. My advice is to sign up at the same money. Well, I think you're right. Yeah, I guess I'm not a good idea. Well, where do we sign up? Uh, right here. Okay. Oh, you're, you're doing the only smart thing. <laughs> Look at me. You people don't know what it means to be cold and hungry for months at a time. Yeah. Well, here it is. 
Now, uh, go out and see if you can square us with George. Well, uh, I'll do my best. Oh, Mr. Burns. Uh, Mr. Burns. Yes? Uh, Mr. Burns, uh, they, uh... I did it. I did it. You did it? Yeah. You mean they signed it? Yes. At the same salary? Right. Well, you did a great job, Harry. Here's ten bucks. <laughs> Will some member of the family be sure to remind Mother to get a can of Spam when she goes shopping tomorrow? She'll like Spam because it's so easy to serve. You'll all like Spam because this grand-tasting meat is so tender, so juicy, so full of flavor that you'll want to serve it often. Spam is the most popular meat item brought out in a long, long time. Thousands of families now use Spam regularly. If you haven't yet tried Spam, now's the time. You're really missing something. Ask for Spam at your food dealers tomorrow. Thank you, bud. Oh, gracious, say good night. Good night. Well, Gracie, it only cost me $10. And I've got you all signed for the same salary. And it only cost us 50 cents. 50 cents? Uh-huh. For what? The invisible ink we signed the contract with. Oh, good night, folks. <laughs> next Monday, same time, same station, for another Burns and Allen show, with Artie Shaw and his orchestra and the smoothie. This is Bud Heaston reminding you to remember that cold or hot, spam hits the spot. Have you tried Hormel Chili Con Carne? Even those who think they don't like chili do like Chili Con Carne the way Hormel makes it because it's different and everybody likes it. Double your money back if you don't like it. Try Hormel Chili Con Carne tomorrow. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm-hmm.